I'm Herb. I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to our emotional sobriety event. We're going to be here for a while, so I hope you're comfortable. And um, I would invite you to join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We'll be talking about emotional sobriety today, and I'm going to take a look at three different aspects. I'm kind of giving you a roadmap for the day so that you know where we're at at any particular time. The first third of this morning, we'll take a look at the orientation and context for doing the 12 steps, the 12 steps to physical sobriety. I'm not going to spend much time on it in the depth that I would normally spend in steps one through nine, but just a context. It'll be innovative for you. You'll see some slides that create models and or concepts and or representations and symbols that will be helpful to capture the words that I'm using, the concepts that I'm using, and make it very practical. I hope that's the goal. The second third will be a deep dive into emotional sobriety itself. And the primary tool, as I see it, it's my interpretation, is step 10. And then the final third will be taking actually a look at a gentle dive, not a deep dive, into spiritual sobriety a term that I've actually coined to represent steps 11 and 12. As I say, it's rounding out our time together. It's giving a sense of complete picture and closure to the impact of the process of the 12 steps. Um, we'll do um, subsequent events that we'll be doing a deep dive into steps 11 and then again in step 12, especially with regard to sponsorship. The retreat center has engaged me and we've agreed to partner doing these events. We call it the spirituality series. The retreat center is about a mile from me. It's a called the Mary and Joseph Retreat Center. It's an ecumenical retreat center, although it's owned by a group of Catholic nuns. They invite anybody who has a message with regard to any aspect of spirituality in any tradition to support human development to come and present at their retreat center and or meet there. It's a phenomenal resource in our area. And they're very supportive of 12-step recovery, and they've been extremely supportive of my work. But of course, during this time of pandemic, they've had to shutter their events so that they don't have a source of income. And because of their support of me over the last 30 years, quite frankly, uh, I've agreed to do these events, these next 10 events, monthly events, uh, as a fundraiser for them. All of the Registration fees go directly to, all of the registration fees go directly to the retreat center. And for that, of course, they barter with me and they do all the administration and all the marketing and relieve me of all of that so that I can just do what I do, which is to talk about my spiritual path and hopefully light it up for those people who want to walk and have a spiritual awakening. Um, my story is interesting to me and to other people somewhat, but it's not the subject of today. I got sober in 1984. My wife actually went to the retreat center for a women's spirituality day, discovered that she had a problem with alcohol, 
and went into a hospital program to deal with it. And I went there to support her and they asked me to look at my drinking and the rest is history. For the very first time I looked at it and I was given the gift. I mean, it's gonna sound silly, uh, almost impossible. I did not pray, I did not go to AA, I did not make a commitment to quit drinking. And yet on February 21st, 1984, Alcohol was removed from my life, and I've never had an inclination to drink since then. I didn't go to AA for another three months. But here's the point of that. I was in AA for four years, still am, I don't mean to be past tense, but I was in AA for four years, 1984 to 1988, and I got a sponsor and I called the sponsor every day and I went to a meeting every day. I got a big book and I read it and I worked the steps on my own. I didn't get any direction from my sponsor on it. Not his fault. He didn't know that he didn't know. And obviously I did it because I was new. So I read it and I worked the steps on my own in that first year. And I finished the steps by my definition. My ninth step was I'm sorry a very sorry ninth step, completely superficial, completely uneventful or unimpactful with regard to me. I did not change. And with regard to everybody else, they did not feel the scales of justice balance, nor any healing or forgiveness. And I know that now I did not know that then. In 1988, and this is really the point now of this story, I met a man who understood the big book, who had an experience of spiritual awakening through the application of those 12 steps precisely. He himself had gone through the steps with a step mechanic, a big book aficionado, if you will. I'm using terms very generally, please be poetic, not, not, not um, legalistic. And, uh, I began the work in February of 1988. I finished it by the end of that year. And in February of 1989, when I looked back over my shoulder, I realized I had been changed. But that wasn't emotional sobriety. That was an understanding of physical sobriety. That was an understanding of addiction. At that point, I'm 48 years old. I have a graduate education in philosophy and theology and then psychology. I studied to be a Catholic priest for seven years. I studied to be a psychologist for five years. I didn't become a priest and I didn't become a psychologist. But those are the platforms. Really solid education and really self-reflective education and experiences. And yet, I didn't know that I didn't know that I was alcoholic. And in 1988, I thought I was, I thought I was a Renaissance man. And when I did the steps in 1988, I had an awakening realizing I'm not a Renaissance man. I'm a Neanderthal. I mean, emotionally, completely unaware that I'm unaware. I'm clueless. It was shocking. When I got sober in 1984, what was shocking to me wasn't that I was an alcoholic, it was I'd never seen it. When I woke up in 1988, it wasn't that I was shocked that I was asleep. It was that I was so asleep I had never realized I was asleep, uh, spiritually, literally spiritually and emotionally. And I began to wake up emotionally. And I did the work again three years later, the complete step work, one through 12, three years later with a different mechanic. And I had another awakening with regard to my addiction. Stories for a different day, not important right now. The important is the history and the process because it's so important to illustrate this is a process of emotional sobriety. So three years later, I did the steps again with another mechanic. This time it took two years. It was a very contemplative process. I wasn't being driven as I was the first time by work. I wasn't being driven as I was the second time by my marriage. I resolved my work. I quit. 
<laughs> completely contrary to what my intention was. I got another job, of course, and it was wonderful. Uh, I resolved the problem with my marriage. Um, I stayed. That wasn't my intention when I started the work. I wanted to leave her on a spiritual basis. And I stayed because at the end of the work, I realized I was the problem. She wasn't the problem. But this was all about physical sobriety. These first journeys were my thawing out in the rooms and in the steps. I thought out physically in the first four years. I thought out emotionally in the second, probably 10 years. And by the time in 1994, I'm 10 years sober and I do this work again for 10 years. At 10 years, it took two years to do the work and I thought out spiritually. You see, uh, what I'm illustrating here, that this is a process. I, I'm not saying that it's going to take years for you. I am saying it took years for me. It's just my story. But I want to capture the reality that it's a process and be patient. And, and my image is stay gently pressed up against this process. Stay gently gently no 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 violence here stay gently pressed up against this process and my experience is that the spirit then embraces us and moves us forward with that willingness all right so We are talking about emotional and spiritual sobriety. The man said to me in 1988, Herb, wow, you have a lot of information, but you have no transformation. You have a lot of academic knowledge, but it's never been applied to your feet, and therefore you've never had an experience of change. And he quoted Einstein. The consciousness that created the problem cannot be the consciousness that solves the problem. You need a new consciousness. He literally looked at the big book on page 58 at that time, as I'm going to do right now. And he quoted from there. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. He said, can you let go absolutely? And I knew he wasn't into trick questions and I heard the, the implications of his question and I realized, yeah, I don't think I can. I obviously haven't, even though I've been willing to, I can't let go of my ideas and my experience. And he said, to the extent that I hold on to those ideas and that experience, I'm absolutely prevented from having any new information and new experience. And I heard that. And he asked me to incorporate into my life a set-aside prayer. And he gave me a prayer it was similar to this, and this has been fine-tuned over time um, by my own experience. I change it periodically. This is the current version. Prayer is about intention. It's not about words. And I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. You're on mute. I'm assuming that you're on mute. <laughs> if you hear a voice and it's yours, you're not. And uh, I would invite you to pray it, and pray it out loud. It's on the screen. Pray it out loud. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, my spiritual path in you, for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my brokenness, my spiritual path, and especially you. I was asked to pray that prayer every day. And any time I sat down to do any of the step assignments. I believe it was the key. Partly of the key because it was uh, not that God intervened. I don't believe in that for a minute. 
but that I believe it opened up my own willingness and my own consciousness to be receptive to new information and to even look for and embrace new information and to take directions uh, that I might not believe in or even feel good about, but to take the directions and suggestions anyway, because I trusted this man and I did want what he had. He explained what he had was a spiritual awakening, which is in fact what Appendix 2 is all about to explain step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I'm quoting. I emphasize the the. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. It's not a result. It's the result. It's not italicized, but I italicize it in the way I say it, because that's my experience. So what is a spiritual awakening? A change in the way we think and feel and behave. That's my summary from Appendix 2. If you haven't read it recently, or haven't read it, goodness, read it and highlight it. It tells you what a spiritual experience is, uh, and what a spiritual awakening is, and how they're different and how they're the same. They're the same in the process. They're, excuse me, they're different in the process. They're the same in the outcome. The outcome is a change. That change I made comment on in my, thun my thinking and my feeling and my behavior. And the key is it's done to me, not by me. Spiritual experience is like a light switch, immediate, phenomenal, overwhelming, mystical, mountaintop like Bill had. Spiritual awakening is very slow. My analogy there is um, dimmer switch. The process that I described, in fact, in my own journey from 1984 through to 1996. Progressively, I was changed. Those first four years, I thought out physically. The next several years I thought out emotionally. And finally in 1994 to 1996, I thought out spiritually. Yeah, no, no, seriously. I did not know that I was an agnostic when I went into that work in 1994, despite having had two spiritual awakenings. You see, my belief about God does not prevent God from working with me. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> oh, golly. And I realized in going through that work that third time that my concept of God that was my original religious tradition from the monastery that I was in for seven years and the practice that I'd had up to that point uh, for 54 years as a practicing Catholic, my concept of God was the very impediment to my relationship with the mystery. I get choked. And I didn't know that I didn't know. And it didn't prevent me from spiritual intervention. That's the grace and that's the gift and that's the hope of all of us. As long as we have an intention and take some actions connected to that intention, the spirit will honor that and bring us forward. And we won't know it and we won't feel it until down the road we pause for a minute and look back over our shoulder in retrospect. And we go, oh, wow. I've been changed. That's everybody's experience 100%. I've been doing this work since 1988. I've been doing workshops with people since 1996. 25 years of working with groups of people. And it's been amazing to have the witness and the, the validation of the effectiveness of this process. And so I use the uh, model of a psychologist named Maslow. Now I've taken his name off of it because I've changed his model to fit my needs uh, to communicate this journey from 
physical sobriety to emotional sobriety to spiritual sobriety. He starts with a triangle and he shows us the foundation is physical. Biology, of course. Air, water, food, and sleep. Just a quick challenge. I'm not going to spend any time on it, but challenge yourself. Are you getting enough sleep? Herb, what's enough? The, the, the research is in. It's conclusive and you're not an exception. Seven and a half to nine hours. Seven and a half to nine hours consistently daily. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're sleep deprived and you will be neurotic. And you will compensate in some way with anger or fear or food or pornography or work or exercise or some other mischief if you're not getting enough sleep. And if you don't believe me, try getting seven and a half to nine hours of sleep for five days. Just change your routine, get it for five days, and at the end of it, be honest with yourself. If, it did, if, if there was no change, then you are unique. And if there is a change, you may want to incorporate it. Emotional sobriety is where we begin here. And I began in 1988 when I began to wake up, to be transformed, to know that I didn't know. That was the beginning. And then, of course, it affected my relationships with other people. In the second time I went through the work, it's resolved my problem with my wife because I accepted that I was the problem. Personal responsibility is the key to happiness. This work is a rite of passage. A rite of passage steps one through nine, a rite of passage of deflation of the ego of depth, a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. Bill says it. In the 12 and 12, a rite of passage. In step six and seven, he uses the term from his day, the gender specific. I like to neutralize it to make it general, neutral, and universal. Bringing children to adulthood. That's what this work is. The first rung on the ladder of emotional sobriety is developing a conscience, which was the beginning in 1988 when I did the fourth column of the resentment inventory. And I saw that all my resentments were generated by me. I did not have a part in my resentment. Oh, no, no, hear this, please. I did not have a part. I ended up owning 100%. My resentments, my anger, my reaction is mine, 100%. That was the beginning of my spiritual awakening, of my thawing out emotionally. And then <clears throat> during that time, this man explained to me, as I will later on to you, the unpacking of step 11. I'll do it in a general and a superficial way by my standards today. Uh, and as I mentioned, there'll be an event planned later on in this spirituality series in which I'll do a three hour deep dive into what I call intentional consciousness. And then finally, there was an organic development in me in 1988, which matured in 1991 and 1994 over time. An organic development internally to me that not only did I go to meetings early and stay late to help out, and not only was my, the suggestion from my sponsor to help other people, but I began to really want to and have a passion about it. Are we human beings looking for a spiritual experience or are we spiritual beings looking for a human experience? Fabulous question. You've heard it many times. You've read about it many times, I'm sure. I've thought about it a lot. I took it into meditation as I do all of these kind of questions that are presented to me or come to me from the spirit presented to me by you in meetings or, or in relationships and conversations, uh, presented to me by the Spirit in my meditation practice. Questions. And I listen. 
I don't listen with my ears, I listen here. I listen here with my heart and with my gut. I've learned to do that in 1988 when I learned how to do meditation. A practice of listening, meditation, directed thinking. I direct my thinking and then I begin thinking. Listening to my thinking as the medium of the message. So Maslow uses the term self-actualization, self-realization, and self-transcendence. I see those as progressively related to and parallel to our steps. Step 10, the development of conscience. Step 11, the development of consciousness. And step 12, the development of compassion. Yes, I like alliteration. Whether or not it's exactly what Maslow said, it doesn't make any difference. I'm using my words to communicate my experience and my information. Back to the question. Am I a human being seeking a, hum uh, a spiritual experience or am I a spiritual being seeking a human experience? And after weeks of meditation, the conclusion was yes. Yes. Yes, two sides of one coin. One of the philosophers in the Middle Ages, in a very kind of tongue-in-cheek and vulgar way, said, we're angels that shit. Uh-huh. I hope you're laughing. We're spirits, of course, in a body. What does that mean? I don't know. But it's an interesting concept, isn't it? One of my teachers says we have a core of goodness. That there is a spiritual reality in us that is us. That's the core of our being, a core of goodness. I love this. I've embraced it. Father Thomas Keating, he's a trap. he was a Trappist monk. He died a couple of years ago. He's the author of Open Mind, Open Heart, which is the development of a contemplative practice outside of the monastery for people like us who aren't trained in meditation or contemplation. And his work is on centering prayer. I conduct a twice a month centering prayer gathering. It's not connected to 12 step. It's all connected to transformation and a relationship with the spirit. It's not prayer. It's not meditation. It's contemplation. Again, I'll be doing some work later on, which if you're interested, you'll be able to participate in. But here we are with that biology again, the Maslow chart at the very foundation. And then uh, our family, of course, develops us. Notice the Russian dolls. I think they're called nesting dolls. I had a woman in my workshop who was from Russia and she said, Matrushka. <laughs> I, I believed her. Matrushka. It means mother. All right. The nesting dolls. And this is us. We have many, 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 many layers of development, emotions and our education. And the whole point of the 12 step process is to realize the bondage of self. That's what's happened to us over the years. We have don't know that we don't know. And what's happened is we've become unhealthy in our self-centeredness. This is what Bill Wilson says is the problem. The addiction, whether it's alcohol, a substance addiction, or codependency, which is a process addiction. Substance, alcohol, drugs and food, process, everything else. Science is pretty well conclusive about alcohol being a liver dysfunction, one out of 10 people. It's not so conclusive about any other substance and or process, but there is a lot of speculation that it's a brain disorder. Doesn't function correctly. We're not normal. It's not a disparaging comment. It's an observation. 
you might have noticed I'm bald. That's not a judgment. It's a fact. My father was bald. His father was bald. His father was bald. All of those people, those fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers were also white and they were also alcoholic. It's not our fault. It's a genetic predisposition. Bill says, we are biologically different and then we are mentally different and then we are different even in our humanity. Different than what we think. Emotional sobriety is about identifying what is this brokenness? You notice I use that word in the set aside prayer. Think about this. This is maybe a mini mm, retreat for you. I'm asking questions. I have lots of information and I can give you information, but if I give you information without a question, there's nothing to hang it on. I find it much more productive to give you questions to invite you to ask these questions in the milieu of the set-aside attitude, in the milieu of the set-aside prayer, and allow yourself to hold on to this question, one of my teachers says, hold on to the asked but unanswered question and allow it to reverberate in you, to percolate in you, in the milieu of prayer and open-minded and open-heartedness, and let the Spirit do the work. Where is my life not working? How effective have been my efforts? Do I really want to change? What changes would I like? And I love this one. It came to me in meditation about 20 years ago in constructing some of these things. What is the invitation? That's the heart of my morning practice. I have a practice every morning of sitting quietly, doing some prayer, doing some meditation, doing some contemplation centering prayer. The heart, the heart, the heart of that quiet time is the question, what is the invitation today? Oh, I might raise it up to what is my invitation for my life. I do that maybe quarterly or once a year in terms of a formal sit and, and reflection. But mostly I'm open to the day. What is the invitation today? You might ask even more specifically, what is the invitation? Here you are. You responded to coming to this workshop. Thousands of people saw the advertisement. And here we are. Almost 100 people. You had an invitation today. You responded to the invitation today. What's that about? What is the invitation of showing up today and of watching and of listening to what we're doing here? There's no right or wrong answer. There's just your answer. Please, there's no tests. I do not give tests. I do not confront people with right or wrong. It's really what is healthy and unhealthy. What is conscious and unconscious? What is your response in your thoughts, in your feelings, in your awareness to these questions and to life as it manifests on a here and now basis? The 12 step process for me has been the most effective process I've ever encountered. As I said, I have a graduate education in, in, in philosophy and in psychology and in theology. It gave me a lot of information, but it gave me no transformation. It's not my fault. I didn't know that I didn't know. I was well intentioned. Those first three steps are about a relationship with power. Spirituality for me is a relationship. People talk about the spiritual side of the 12-step program, and one of my 
mentors in the rooms said, there's two sides to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's two sides to the 12 step program, the spiritual side and the outside. Whoa. You see, it's all spiritual because it's all about a relationship with power. It's not about addiction. Bill's very clear on that. Page 64, page 102. Alcohol is a symptom. Bottles are only a symbol. And throughout the book, he's very clear. Getting sober, getting abstinent is merely the beginning. Then it's about growing up and showing up. We identify the obstacles to power in ourselves, four through seven. We identify the obstacles in ourself with others in steps eight and nine. And then he says, we enter the world of the spirit. Wow, that is so powerful. Steps one through nine, unlock the door for a walk into the world of the spirit. Well, where were we before? Look at the chart. We're in the world of self. Steps one through nine are the world of self. The process is the turning from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. If you can get that concept, you will understand organically the internal process of the steps. Steps one through nine, the turning from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. Steps 10, 11, and 12, the fostering of the other-centeredness. Step 10, removing the obstacles on a daily basis to my relationship with power in others. Step 11, fostering my relationship with other. Step 12, fostering my relationship with others. A spiritual coin again. Step 11 and step 12, other-centeredness. So the process of uh, steps one through nine is the ego deflation of de at depth. Bill says, this is my story, right? To take a look at my addiction, to take a look at my family, to take a look at my relationships and my reactions to the reality as I see it and I'm attempting to navigate it so that I can come down to this core of goodness that is me and realize that I have power in me that isn't me, but that is available to me, that cares about me, and is ready to have a relationship with me and to restore me to sanity. No, well, that's a summary of the process. Sanity meaning healthy, coming from the Latin sanus, S-A-N-U-S, health. In sanus meaning not healthy. That's all it means in the big book. It does not mean psychiatric and psychological. It does mean health or unhealthy. It's important in step one to know that in terms of the mental problem. It's not that we have a psychiatrically diagnosable, some of us do, but most of us don't, problem. It's that we have a mind that doesn't work correctly. That's all. It doesn't remember to remember. It doesn't know that it doesn't know. And it's very slow in learning that. But it's more important in step two, restored to sanity. That means we've been given the ability to have a spiritual shield that makes us invulnerable to the obsession. Our mind is working correctly. We're in a position of neutrality with regard to our addiction. I'm using words from the big book, page 85. When we enter the world of the spirit, we're placed in a position of neutrality. Hear the vocabulary. We are placed. This is grace. This is gift. This is not something that we can earn. This is not something that we can keep. We can prepare ourselves to receive it, and we can prepare ourselves to keep it. But we can't receive it, and we can't keep it because we try hard. Oof. You're either powerless or you're not. The word grace is gift, not earned, not manipulated. 
gift freely given. And most of us have a story, and this is what we unpack in steps four through nine. And we go from the suffering to the healing in step nine. We go from the suffering, realizing that we're not a victim, that we are responsible. We go from powerlessness to power. We go from the false self to the true self, to use the current psychology. We go from no meaning to meaning, and we go from darkness to light. That's my favorite metaphor. What, there's so many thousands of years and thousands of people that have speculated on human development. Philosophers talk about the life of virtue. Religions talk about doing the will of God. Most of the religious traditions have at their core finding out what is and doing the will of God. Psychology, of course, talks about well-being, especially positive psychology since the 1900s, uh, uh, early 20th century. There's a whole school on positive psychology that's focused on normal psychology, not abnormal psychology. The research and happiness tells us that we are seeking pleasure and meaning in our biology and in our psychology. Those are the two things that bring happiness. Avoid suffering and embrace joy. No, really, it's that simple. I've read 10 books on happiness coming out of the Harvard Institute of Happiness, research that's been going on for 20 years out of positive psychology also. The bottom line, if you want to be happy, that's your only goal. You'll never be happy. Oops. If you want to be happy, and that's your only goal, to be happy, you will never be happy. Because happiness is not a product, it's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of your context and meaning with life and your relationship of service to the people around you. Wow. Is that steps 11 and 12? Are we so fortunate to have a methodology that gives us the key not only to our own sanity, but to a life of happiness. To be turned from the world of self to the world of the spirit. This is what we're looking at in terms of this process. As I say, I keep using that term in all of my talks because it's about that turning that gives us this freedom and it's a process not not an experience excuse me it's a process not a task and not an event but it's an experience bill uses the term rocketed into the fourth dimension well what are we talking about fourth dimension the third dimension is height width and depth you go to a movie theater and you have 3D glasses that they give you, 3D dimension, height, width, and depth. It allows you to see what the artist created in terms of a full involvement with the cinematic experience. Fourth dimension in Bill's terminology is the world of the spirit, the immaterial world. Steps one through uh, three are the first stage. It's going from self-centeredness, notice, there is a life force, we identify that in step two, and we have free will, and we're invited in step three with our free will to turn to be in alignment with, my words, not from the big book, to turn to be in alignment with reality. We turn our will and our life over to the care of God. We're not turning our will and our life over to God. That's a critical distinction, not subtle. It's like when I get in my car, I know where I want to go. It's my car. I have the keys. I know how to drive, and it's insured. But I don't know how to get there. 
So I put in the, direct, uh, the address into the GPS, and then I listen and I follow direction. It's a perfect metaphor for meditation, certainly, but also for the life of being in alignment with the reality as it's manifesting. I don't have to use the words, the will of God. Reality as it's manifesting. Reality just is. Don't take it personally. Reality just is what it is. Our lack of acceptance of reality is our immaturity. Our not accepting reality as it is, is the source of our suffering. We have a script on how it should be. And when we try to impose on others and on ourselves and on the world, what should be, we suffer. Because what should be isn't what is. And what is, is reality. It's not right or wrong. It's not healthy or unhealthy. Reality just is. Unfortunately, we take it personally. We have a story about it. And we don't know that we have a story because we have a story that's so strong that it is the only reality that we see. And we need a new pair of glasses. And that's what this gives us. New lenses through which to look. I invite you to pray the third step prayer with me as I articulate it. You're on mute. Pray it out loud if you care to. It's on the screen. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you wish. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. Notice I uh, brought it to current English language rather than the these and the thous. I take that liberty because prayer is not about words, it's about the intention. But what gets in the way, Bill says, right after you do the third step, immediately begin that fourth step. What gets in the way? We need to identify and analyze the various manifestations of self-centeredness. On page 62, he said, that's the root of the problem, isn't it? Resentment and fear and sex and dishonesty and secrets and guilt and shame. Guilt and shame, words that are not in the big book, but that I would be remiss in not looking at when I'm helping somebody unpack their history and inventory. And then we enter that second stage. Steps four through seven. Removing the obstacles to our relationship with ourself. And we go into the final stage, the third stage of the rocket launch in where we were removing the obstacles to others through steps eight and nine. Originally, Bill said that we were in the bondage of self. This is where we are, really. Hello, look at the image. You saw the poor little Herbie in the jail looking through the bars. There's no ceiling, there's no walls, there's no floor. It's just Herbie holding bars in front of his face, looking through the bars, thinking he's in jail and in complete delusion. Oh my God, that is so representative of our lives. We don't know that we don't know that all we have to do is drop the bars. I call it the healing prayer, step, 11, uh, step seven, the healing prayer. Please join me. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. I use that prayer every morning at the end of my 
meditation practice. Listen to that last line. It's a great launching pad for the day. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Step 11 itself ends with two phrases. Praying for the knowledge of your will for me and the power to do it. I need to know what to do and then I need the power to do it. Wonderful organic integration. Bill's approach to the construction of these 12 steps. Perfectly in sync with our human development. Perfectly in sync with our human needs. At this point, Bill says, we enter the world of the spirit. We've recovered, actually. Read the title page in the big book, how thousands of men and women have recovered the past tense. And he uses that term consistently. I do believe, as the uh, script indicates there, as the picture indicates, that that's about the first half of the first step. That's about the addiction, the body problem, the allergy, the biology problem, and the mind problem the psychology problem, the delusion and obsession problem. We've recovered. Page 85 says we've been placed in a position of neutrality. We're not in recovery. We're not recovering. We've been given the gift of freedom from addiction. Ah, but listen, hang on. That's physical sobriety, but he said we're not cured. We have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And then he says, we're rocketed into the fourth dimension. We're in orbit around the light. As long as we maintain that relationship with other and others, we're not cured. We have a practice that we're recommended, step 10, which is about emotional sobriety, and step 11, which is about improved understanding. And step 12, which is about enlarged effectiveness. He says in step 10, 84 and 85 in the big book, our job now is to increase in, effect, in understanding and effectiveness. I use the term improved because of the step itself. I use the word enlarged because in the big book, in Jim's story, the fellow who put a little whiskey in his milk, it said he failed to enlarge his spiritual life on page 35. He failed to enlarge his spiritual life, but he doesn't tell us what that means. But in Bill's own story on page 14 at the bottom of that page, he does tell us what it means. Failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. Bill says this is our way of life, all right? in orbit around the light. I hope you saw that. I'm going to do it again because my artist who creates my slides is wonderful. Look at this. Isn't that fabulous? We're in orbit around the light. This is our way of life. Our way of life is a phrase that signifies steps 10, 11, and 12. Our way of life is a phrase that Bill uses 20 different times throughout the big book. Steps one through nine is the program of recovery. Steps 10, 11, and 12 is the program of living. I'm going to stop here and take a five minute at least pause so that you can uh, ask and I can hopefully answer some of your questions. And um, then we'll go back to uh, it in five or ten minutes, depending on the level of questions that you might have, um, or concerns, or resistances, or confusion. Uh, one of the, the, the awarenesses that I got this morning is, you know, when you were working with your sponsor, and you, 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 you know, your first time, and he said, Herb, you have a lot of knowledge, but you have no transformation. And I was wondering all the time, well, what was he listening to or what did he see that allowed him to see that observation, hear that observation? And I got it. Mm. You were totally self-absorbed. Duh. <laughs> you see how simple it is? Uh, and, and I thought, 
wow, isn't that a, a transformation that, you know, and it's in listening. Now, if we just keep coming back and we listen with a willingness to listen, oh my God, you know, I thank you so much. I, I just want to say that was just one of them. And I had a series of them today. Yeah. So thank you. I, I'm coming back. Thank you very much, and also for your succinctness, but the key uh, that I got from what you said that I want to underline, score, a uh, highlight is a willingness to listen, to listen, knowing that it's a special effort. I can't do it effectively, but I can be willing to do it and have it done to me. That's that whole set aside attitude. You see, I see a collaboration. Uh, my willingness to take action and God's grace, the Spirit's grace, gift, hand in hand, hand in glove, kind of a collaborative co-creation. God can do it without me, but normally doesn't. I can't do it without God. And, and that's my history. But together and i i there's the mystery though i have a picture all right it's a picture of the sistine chapel the god reaching down from heaven and a human reaching up from earth but notice that there's a blank spot in between there's where the x plus factor is there's where the mystery is there's where the faith is my action and willingness are important, but it doesn't precipitate the gift of grace. The gift of grace is what precipitates my conversion and transformation, and I can't make it happen. I can hope that it will, and I can work as if I expect it to, but I can't make it happen, and I'm always surprised when it does happen. Yeah? Okay, thank you so much. Sometimes the thoughts that I hear really scare me mm. and it's not, I can't see any evidence in my reality around me and I don't know which one is, is God's will and it's really hard for me. And so that's when I reach out to others and I say, hey, um, let me check my thoughts. And most of the time people are like, that's just your fear. That's just your fear. And I, I haven't been able to get over, I'm always, I'm always paranoid. Like, is it going to come back? Is it come back? Because it, it's not a lot of thoughts, but it's thoughts about my relationship. And they scare me, and they come up, and I can't sure. get past it. So I just wanted to ask you about uh, fear. And I, and I know I don't have time for a second question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I see a lot of people that don't get the gift. I see a lot of people that don't get the grace, and I feel kind of survivor's guilt. What you're, what you're seeing is they don't respond to the gift. I believe mm. everybody gets the gift. Okay. Hmm. I can now, work with that. I, 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 there's a whole mystery in here. Woo! I stay out of it. I just like, okay, I'm just going to observe, do the best I can. That's the serenity prayer, isn't it? It's about wisdom. See, I, I jettisoned, threw away the word control three decades ago. Because I <laughs> realized I don't have any control. Outside, inside. I have some influence. Outside, I have some influence. Inside, I have some influence. I have more influence inside than I do outside. But I have influence, no control. And I need wisdom to kind of navigate that path. Now, you, I think you said right from the beginning, the, I think the essential key to discerning the difference between the ego and God's voice. And that is I talk to somebody else. Okay. I use somebody as a sounding board. And you'll see later on when I get into spiritual sobriety, I believe that the key component to progress on the spiritual path is accountability. Because hmm. if you have an accountability partner, you'll do every other moving part eventually. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and I didn't come to that quickly. That was like 15 years into my recovery and my experience. But... I had experience with a lot of people who did a lot of things and the common factor in every one of them who had deteriorated was that they decided that they were okay. They had enough knowledge now. They could navigate it without talking to anybody. They could figure it out on their own. They didn't need a sounding board. They didn't need any advice or direction. 
all five of those people, their lives had turned to caca. <laughs> Oop. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate Thank your time. You so much. Wonderful. I was thinking, you know, when you start talking about reality as, as a higher power, um, I think that's what you meant. Oh, uh, you know, that's a wonderful connection. And I do, I didn't say that, but you made the connection because you intuited what I was thinking. So reality with a capital R. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. How important is it to define in some concrete way, like in a paragraph or something, uh, what your higher power is. Yeah. It was the, uh, I don't know how important it is. It was the instructions that I received the third time I went through the work that allowed me to see my own agnosticism and then to see that I had the invitation of step two is for me to define my concept based on what I need and what I want at that time. At that time. And my concept of God changes as I change. So to answer your question, I don't believe it's important that we have any image or words. I do believe it is important that we have a loosely held concept of what it is we do believe at the time loosely held and then allow it to change as we change so the question i would ask people to ask themselves is in your relationship with power what do you need and what do you want in terms of attributes and qualities attributes and qualities. What do you need at this time in your life? And what do you want in attributes and qualities? At, in the beginning, father was a good word for me. Then it became mentor. Then it became guide. Then it became light. Then it became mystery. And recently I've been using, for the last five years, I've been using the word flow because I really got attached to this concept of alignment and I want to be in the flow with a capital F and I'm also because yeah yeah because of my work in emotional sobriety I'm also using reality with a capital R so your your, your intuitions were right on the money yeah I I agree and over these years my um, it's like an evolutionary process that is correct okay. As, as is life. <laughs> as is life. Because you know, beginning with just the group, yeah. and evolving, evolving, and now very similar to you as far as mystery and the reality of the yeah. truth. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, I, I really have embraced the set-aside attitude. Hmm. All right. Um, Holy Spirit, open up my mind and my heart Release me from up till now, detach me from after now, and allow me to be fully present in the now. Mm. That's my morning prayer. I don't, I've never memorized the set aside prayer that I created. <laughs> it, it, I, that's why I have to read it every time. But that one, it came out of my meditation practice. Release me from up till now detach me from after now and allow me to be fully present in the now. That's where I want to live, right there. Totally aware and conscious of this moment because that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. I've been working with my sponsor for a while and about four or five years ago, I had an experience that looked like, wow, this is the pattern that occurs over and over again that I really need to look at and work on. And what it was is I lent money to a person in a 12-step program and took a long time to get the money back. And then they ended up unfriending me and, and it went really south. But luckily my sponsor said that she pointed to the page that uh, we made it, you made a decision based on self, which later put you in a position to be hurt. So I started seeing that pattern repeat over and over again and looking at that then I came to the conclusion that if my motives are pure, if I pray and, and 
you know, have my motives be pure and not have any selfish motives, then I'm going to be, then that pattern isn't going to repeat and I'm going to be free, right? Wrong. And then you know, wrong. Some... <laughs> yeah, that's right, wrong. <laughs> Yeah, because you're and still I'm delusional. <laughs> and it hit me when we read the page 60 the other day. It says that, um, in, that we're convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody. And it says right here, even though our motives are good. Yeah. So I'm trying to bridge that gap to get from, I need to see what my motives are, make sure I don't have selfish motives. But then even though I have, have pure motives, I still get into trouble. I need help with that. Yeah, no, what a gift that is. And I can see that you've, you've connected to the truth in such a way that it's cracked you open at the soul level. That's right, that's what happens to me all the time I cry. When I connect to the truth, it's kind of like, oh, my God, thank you. But I'm so embarrassed in my own presence that I didn't see that I didn't see. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. One of the questions you asked is, what changes would I like in my life? Mm. And that just is, is a really scary question for me. Why? Why is it scary? I don't know why. I'm like choking up when I said it out loud. Yeah. Um, because... I guess because of my history, the changes I've made in my life, I never make changes until it blows up. You know, it's like I have to hit these rock or brick walls or rock. Most walls. human beings are like that. You know, changes change. We don't like change because uh, we, we, we have a sense that we can't control. And that's the delusion that we had control anyway. But go ahead. Yeah. So I, I guess as I'm saying this, I realized, if I really said, okay, God, you know, my, these are the changes I would like in my life. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of what it would take to get there or what I would lose to get there or, yeah, um, yeah or that yeah. maybe I won't get any of it. And yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just like, it's, that's why I, would, the, I, when I wrote the question, I thought, God, that's a really scary question. Okay. Don't ask me that. Well, 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 it you know it sounds like you've you're looking directly in the eyes of fear, which is the first step to reducing its power, and then you walk toward it, which makes no sense at all. It's totally counterintuitive, which is what you're doing by talking about it. And I suggest that you talk to a sponsor about it, that you pray about it, and uh, there's there's some actions here for you to surface the underneath, what will be the implications? So you need to get in touch with your fear. In the fear inventory on page 68, Bill says, we name our fear and then we ask, why do I have it? Why do I have this fear? What's the source? And of course he gives us very glibly, but very wisely the answer is because of self-reliance. And you know how reliable you are not. <laughs> how powerful you are not. And right now things are going fairly smoothly. And if you make any change, you have no idea, you know, if you're going to hit white water or not in the rafting sense. And you don't want white water, you want calm water. So it's better not to change anything and put up with the current suffering. That's the delusion that will keep you stuck. And, and, and it's a cancer that will metastasize over time and it will choke the life out of your soul. So, and that's where we're going with step 10 in emotional sobriety is to deal with that fear. Pray, talk to somebody about it, and then turn your thoughts to helping somebody else. That's the formula in the big book. Thank you. Yeah, well, becoming conscious of it is the absolute first step. So you're, you, you've done a major thing, not only in yourself, but then sharing it with 100 people. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I thought, oh, that's a tough question, glibly. But then when I said it out loud, I was like, geez, where does all yeah. these tears come from? Well, see, no, see what, you've, what you're revealing is my experience. The fourth step is a, something that we do in writing, and we write in days and weeks and months, sometimes even years go by as we're writing and writing and writing. And then we read it all out loud consecutively and it washes over us and gives us an experience. For the very first time, we see the devastation of our history. 
at a cellular existential level like you're doing when you verbalize it. So that's why the magic of step 10. Not only is it about recognizing it and praying about it, it's about talking about it with somebody else. What's the difference if I formally um, meditate as soon as I wake up or after I say a prayer or at 11 o'clock? Is All there right. a difference? No, I understand the question. All right. So um, the big book says upon awakening. Yeah. Right, and I believe it's because Bill's frame of reference is that meditation is for guidance. Yes. So upon awakening, and for me, I, I go to the bathroom and brush my teeth and I get a cup of coffee. And it's probably a half an hour to an hour before I sit down to do my meditation because oh. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And when I'm ready to do my meditation, then I do because I'm looking for guidance for the day. I'm looking for guidance. Now, if you want to do it at one o'clock in the afternoon to get guidance, who cares? If you want to do it at six o'clock at night to get guidance, who cares? Now, the real question is, what will you do? What can you do? What can you do? What will you do on a daily practice basis? So it doesn't actually matter when. What is your, no, this is, act, this is rhetorical. I'm not asking for an answer. I want you to think about the question and everybody too. Why are you meditating? We're, we're going to look a little bit later on in the third segment of our talk together today. Um, a little bit more about that, but ask yourself, well, why, why do I go into quiet time? Why do I even want to pray and meditate? What's the purpose of it? What's the value of it? What's the benefit to me of it? Those are key questions that will bring consciousness into your consciousness practice. So two questions. Uh, first, would it be possible for you to please repeat that, uh, the prayer about the now? Uh, yeah. Um, I address differently the spirit depending on my mood. So right now I'm in the mood of Holy Spirit. So I would say, Holy Spirit, release me from up till now. Detach me from after now. And allow me to be fully present in the moment, in the now. Yeah. You said you had two questions? Um, yeah, the second question is, do you feel that it's better to do one longer meditation or a few short ones, like throughout the day? Well, I think you need to answer that question for yourself. What works and what's helpful? Okay. Yeah, because it's very personal. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I, I, I personally find a morning meditation, which I do now about 30 minutes, maybe 45. It grew, it grew from five minutes. Sometimes I uh, have an afternoon and sometimes I have an evening. Um, usually I have a second time during the day or if before the evening is over. Um, but it, I, I don't try to be consistent about that. I am absolutely consistent about the morning practice. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Nick. All right, so here's where we left off. We entered the world of the spirit. This is our way of life. Step 10 is cleaning the channel. Think in terms of the St. Francis prayer. Make me a channel, right? So we clear the channel with step 10. We fill the channel with step 11. And we allow the channel, we're the channel, to distribute the grace and the light that is in us to those around us. That's a, a, a wonderful, I think, mm, synopsis of or summary of. Steps 10, 11, and 12. What is emotional sobriety? Sobriety itself. Well, I think it's balance. I think it's harmony. Balance within myself and harmony with other people. That's what we mean by sobriety here. Um, when we talk about emotional. So here's a couple questions. Do I have a sense of well-being? Do I have contentment in my life? These are key questions for us. I'm going to give you a moment. In the milieu of the set-aside attitude, open your mind and heart. You're on this call for a personal invitation. Was it because there's some area of agitation or disturbance in your life? 
the 12 and 12 uses the term, whenever I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. I love the word disturbed because it encompasses all the aspects of the fourth step. Fourth step is the mother of all inventories, resentment, fear, and unhealthy sex and secrets. And the 10th step is a recap of that. It says, continue to take personal inventory. The 12 and 12 confirms the use of the 10th step. The big book confirms what it is. I'll look at that here in a minute. But the 12 and 12, if you haven't read step 10 in the 12 and 12, I really suggest you do. And if you haven't done it recently, I suggest you do reread it because it's powerful. It tells us exactly when to use and why to use step 10. It says it's a spiritual axiom. Whenever I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. If you have any resistance to that concept, you haven't done a fourth step. No, I'm serious. If you have any resistance to the concept that your troubles are of your own making 100%, it's never people, circumstances, or events. Yeah, I use the term never. It's never people, circumstances, or events. It's always our reaction to people, circumstances, and events. Our reaction is our problem 100%. So this is how our brain is developed. That's why I also like the Maslow chart, and that's why I like the step process as I've outlined it in terms of um, uh, the three parts of the problem in the disease, a problem of the body and a problem of the mind and a problem of the will. It's the way we're built as a, as a brain. I'm, I, I'm not a scientist, but I understand uh, the general dynamics of the brain. We have a brain stem right at the top of the spinal cord, just below the cranium. We have a brain stem. It's our lizard brain for survival, physical survival, that Maslow first level of biology. I use a carrot, a vegetative state. We're thirsty and hungry and we need to mate. That all comes out of the brain stem. Then we have developed over millions of years our limbic system, which manages our emotions, or that's its intent anyway, for emotional survival. It's our feelings of fight, flight, and freeze. Bill uses that indirectly in the fourth step in the 12 and 12. He said, instincts gone awry. Instincts at the biological survival level. Fight, anger, resentment. Flight, fear and anxiety. Freeze, dishonesty, camouflage, hiding. Guilt and shame, those would be my interpretations. Dishonesty, the primary underbelly of motives in our inappropriate and unhealthy sexual relations. Instincts gone awry. But then millions of years later, we developed a cortex. This is the final and third brain, which has two functions that make us specifically human that we can know and know that we know and that we can decide freely. Now, the real challenge is our minds are defective, as I've indicated in a very superficial way early on in our discussion. We don't know that we don't know and can't see that we don't see. But the real problem is that I can make a decision. I have free will, but it's not free in some areas. Bill says that we're not free in our self-centeredness. And on page 62, if you haven't read those two paragraphs, I really recommend you read those two paragraphs. It talks about the unmanageability and the self-centeredness, which is the spiritual malady. This is the problem, not addiction. The two paragraphs on page 62 describe unmanageability, the exact nature. We have beliefs through which we see lenses, that we use lenses and that are distorted. 
and we have emotions as a result of that that are disturbed. One of the Russian philosophers, Gurdjieff, said, all human beings are asleep dreaming that they're awake. Oh man, do you love those wisdom sayings? We're asleep dreaming that we're awake. And I woke up in 1984 that I was an alcoholic and I didn't know. And I was startled that I had never seen it. And I woke up in 1988 that I'm a Neanderthal, not a Renaissance man. And I was embarrassed that it was so and that I had never seen it. And in 1994, I woke up to the fact that I'm a agnostic, and by the way, a narcissist also, and I didn't know either of those two things. And when I went through the steps the third time in 10 years of sobriety, this man unpacked for me unmanageability. Most people don't know this in the rooms. Unmanageability is defined by Bill Wilson on page 52. He calls it the bedevilments. To be controlled as if by devils is my dictionary definition. He doesn't name it there on page 52. He just describes this behavior of mine. And I make it personal and present tense. I am having trouble with personal relationships. I can't control my emotional nature. I am a prey to misery and depression. I can't make a living. And in my meditation, the wee small voice said, that satisfies you. It completed what the big book had intended, but what I had not seen in the writing until I did the meditation. And the wee small voice said, and, and you're a bottomless pit. You're a black hole. There's not enough recognition or power or pleasure. Is there, Herb? I have a feeling of uselessness. I am full of fear. I am unhappy. I can't seem to be of real help to other people. And I took that into meditation. And the wee small voice said, and you don't actually care about other people. This is 1994. You don't actually really care about other people. Ten years sober, having studied to be a priest, having studied to be a psychologist, and now I'm a sponsor in AA. And the wee small voice said, and you don't care about helping other people. You care about having the reputation of helping people. Oh, man. And I was beginning to also see in my therapy with a very skilled uh, therapist in recovery, my unseen narcissism up to that point. And this description fit perfectly. And he said to me about the DSM description of narcissism, there are nine characteristics and the only thing missing in the scientific manual is your picture. Oh, yeah, really. And I was paying him for that too. And anyway, Dr. Berger is my co-facilitator now. Uh, we've become friends and colleagues in presenting about emotional sobriety. If you have a chance to get any of his books, I really highly recommend Dr. Alan Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E he's 49 years sober in the program, and he's got many books produced by Hazelton. So you have to ask yourself, is my life one of serial suffering? Do I believe my life can change? Huge questions for us to regard. And these are the questions that set us up for step 10. I started to describe from the 12 and 12 how it confirms the particular use and occasion it's a spiritual axiom. Whenever we're disturbed, there's something wrong with us. It said, step 10 is a spot check inventory. And Bill says, watch for the things that we saw in the, in the step four inventory. Watch for fear and dishonesty and selfishness. But now you have to, I'm a big book literalist and fundamentalist. Pay attention to the words in the big book. He says, when they crop up. He doesn't say if they crop up. Oh, I'm a human being and I'm always going to be a human being and I'm always going to be challenged by the speed bumps of life. Yes, 
I have instincts of fight, flight, and freeze. That's my biology. That's my psychology. It's the way I'm wired. It's the way I'm structured. I'm in acceptance of reality. And I know that I'm having a speed bump when I'm disturbed. So he says, when you're disturbed, you take action. And here's where the big book then confirms the four part process of becoming undisturbed or going back to that. If I'm disturbed, I'm going cross purposes to the flow of reality. Look at my arms. I'm going cross purposes to the flow of reality. Step 10 is the turning that we accomplish through doing steps one through nine, that turning to put us in alignment with not turning my will and my life over to God. No, that's not the phrase. Turning my will and my life over to the care of God, the GPS. I'm in alignment with, I listen for, I take guidance for, and I have a, I know where I want to go. I want to be in harmony. I want to be a life of contentment. If I'm disturbed, I'm not that way. I can turn in grace to be placed in alignment with the light. He says, first we pray. Well, because we're powerless. Underneath every step is powerless. Check it out. When you do the step work in each step, Bill says we're powerless. It's clear in step one, but it's also clear in step two. He says we cannot create an adequate concept. In step three, we cannot turn. We need God, and that's why that's a prayer. In step four, under resentment, under fear, and under sex, he says, and you can't get rid of it, so you pray. Under step five, he said, you can't be honest, so you pray. Under step six, he says, you can't remove your character defects, so you pray for, will pray for willingness. It's great to be willing, but we're not willing to be willing in many cases. And we don't even know that necessarily. And we pray for the willingness. And in step seven, we pray for the removal. And in step eight, we pray for the knowledge of the people that we harmed and how to correct that. And in step nine, we pray for the power to do it. Under each step is powerlessness. Under each step is the recommendation for prayer, for power, a relationship and the gift of grace. But we're still responsible for our action. So he says, we discuss it with somebody. The word sponsor is not in the big book. So he doesn't say, we, we call our sponsor. He says, we just talk to somebody. Maybe somebody not even in the program, a good friend, a partner, an accountability partner is really good. The sponsor is great. Spiritual director. And then we make an amend. Well, I know that if I'm disturbed, I'm normally going to be disturbing other people. I mean, that's just how it works. If I'm disturbed, I'm going to share the wealth. And it's not my intention, but it's just what happens. The fallout, collateral damage. I, I don't mean it glibly, and I don't mean to dismiss my responsibility, but I, I also don't want to get too heavy here. But I make an amend if I've created any harm. Harm is not my behavior. When I ask people about the eighth step, they start describing their behavior. I understand that you need to get into your behavior in order to understand the harm, but the behavior is not the harm. The harm is the impact, the negative impact of my behavior on somebody else. The negative impact of my behavior on somebody else. I have to see it from their view, not mine. And then I turn my thoughts to helping somebody else. I used to have the word service there, but I dropped it. The wee small voice again said, Herb, service is too sophisticated a term. You need a term that has earth in it, has dirt in it. Help. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be tired. They're going to not be aware of the misuse of your time. If you want to truly help. Now, if you have any trouble determining between helping and enabling that codependency underbelly for most of us, 
go to Al-Anon. They've made a science out of a distinction between help and enabling. Helping will actually heal people. Enabling will actually kill people. And it's huge. It's a huge difference. It's not intuitive. It needs to have wisdom people that will guide us as an accountability partner. Now, I make this up in terms of the contrast to the first column of watch for resentment. If, in fact, you're dealing effectively with resentment, you're in forgiveness. If you're dealing effectively with fear, you're in trust. If you're dealing effectively with dishonesty, you're in honesty. And if you're dealing effectively with your selfishness, you're, you have an attitude and a state of being of love. These are my words. They're not from the big book or even from the 12 and 12, but they're implied in both. This is what I call emotional sobriety. I've done quite a bit of work in the area of forgiveness. It's a process, not an event. It's really important to know that. Forgiveness is a process, just like the steps are a process. It's not an event. And what is the process? It's a process of making a decision to release them. Look at my hand. I looked up the word forgiveness in a dictionary, and it says a decision to release them. That gesture really helped me understand forgiveness. I'm releasing them. There's a lot of misunderstanding about forgiveness. The St. Francis prayer says, we release them and then we are released. The Lord's prayer says, we forgive them their debts and then we are forgiven our debts. It's counterintuitive and it's one of those spiritual paradoxes. As we release them, we are released. But it is a process. Notice on the slide, it's not condoning. I'm not going to read them all. You can look at that. Well, maybe I will because we're being recorded. Condone, forget, tolerate, ignore, approve, excuse, minimize, pardon, deny, absolve, reconcile, invite to hurt again, or surrender justice. No, none of those things. Forgiveness is not any of those things. What it is, it's a decision to not retaliate or exact revenge or seek compensation or to judge. It's a decision to release them, to release ourselves, and to be released. There's a wonderful process that's been articulated by a psychologist, Dr. Fred Luskin. Fred Luskin, L-U-S-K-I-N. He's a PhD clinical psychologist at Stanford University. He's a professor there. He did his doctoral dissertation on forgiveness 30 years ago. And then uh, he, put it, he put that dissertation into a, uh, a book called Forgive for Good. You might assume, as a result of my comments concerning my educational and academic background, that I've read some books. I'm a reader. So I'm saying that to help you prepare for what I'm about to say. The best book I've ever read because of its effectiveness in terms of human development is the big book, because it was the only book that effectively allowed me to change. The purpose of all of this now is to make this statement. The second most important book I've ever read is Dr. Luskin's book, Forgive for Good. The name of it is Forgive for Good, and he articulates the psychological process and principles of forgiveness. We were asked to do a panel together about 25 years ago, so I read his book. We did the panel. It went well. And afterwards, I was saying to him, I read your book. The principles and the process that you describe psychologically are the same as those I experience spiritually and in the 12-step program. The process and the dynamics are absolutely the same. The words are different. And he said, yes, of course, underneath the underneath the underneath, the, the human dynamic is absolutely the same. And coming from psychology, my words will be different when you come from spirituality. He said, but you, spiritual 12-step people, have a real advantage. 
I said, what's that, Fred? He said, you got God. I can't use that term. I cannot use that reality. I'm a scientist. I'm a, I'm a researcher. I'm a psychologist. But it's a tremendous X plus factor giving a lot more power to the process of forgiveness. I thought that was unusually humble of a highly reputable scientist like himself to acknowledge that. You will see that his steps are the same process as we experience in our 12 steps, to name it, my hurt in the fourth step to understand it, my hope in the fourth column. To identify the rules, my beliefs in the third column of the resentment inventory. To acknowledge the reality that I'm 100% responsible for my reaction. And to accept reality as it is and know that I have the power of decision of acceptance. I cannot change reality. I can accept reality as it is. And then I implement my decision through my action. Forgiveness is a process of change. Certainly, changing my attitude, changing in terms of accepting reality as reality is, not as I think it ought to be. A key to thinking, excuse me, a key to identifying what we believe is the word should. If you hear yourself thinking, feeling, saying the word should, you are identifying a belief. Just ask yourself, is the belief accurate? I should, you should, they should, the world should, employers should, priests should, parents should, children should. These are all stories. A lot of it's a lot of delusion, Disney-like, fairy tales. It's about taking actions based on reality, not based on our myths about reality. Human development is very slow. We go from dependence, as you know, Human beings take the longest period to come adulthood. We, we, we call legally adults at 18 and 21. Today, I know lots of uh, postgraduate students from college that are living at home dependent on their parents. And they're dependent until they're 30, 35, and 40. It's just an observation. It's not a criticism, but that level of dependence is in contrast to independence. That's that first level of becoming an adult, independent and responsible for my own behavior, and then interdependent, responsible for my relationships with other people. When I read Melody Beattie's book, Codependent No More, and I'm reading it for the third time, it's also a very good book on codependence, Codependent No More by Melody Beattie. She has a, new, a term that just caught my attention this time in my third reading, undependent. So that's the balanced relationship between independence and interdependence, that balance that comes from emotional sobriety, that balance that comes from the practice, that becomes really the balance and the harmony of emotional sobriety, where I am conscious in self-management. That's really the key. I'm conscious in self-management. Happiness is what I've mentioned before and in the studies that um, I've, I've taken a look at. It's all about coordination with and understanding of how we're structured in our brain. We need pleasure at the biological level, all right? And we need meaning in terms of the cortex level. The brainstem needs to be having that satisfaction of sleep and, and thirst and hunger in a balanced way. Our emotions need to be in equilibrium, managing the balance in our emotions 
and using our cortex, our, our human brain, to manage our limbic system and our brain stem. Addicts are initially, because of hijacked by the addiction, we allow our emotions and our body to manage our mind. Short-term gain for long-term pain. And of course, in recovery, we reverse that. Short-term pain, the steps, for instance, taking direction, for instance, doing actions that we don't believe in, doing actions that we don't want to do, doing, act, doing actions that don't make any sense, but we're doing it because we want what they got acts contrary to our behavior, acts contrary to our thinking, con acts contrary to our knowledge, acts contrary to our will. That's why we need experienced wisdom people to be connected to. And then using our cortex to develop meaning and value. As I've mentioned, happiness is to reduce suffering and to increase joy. It's that simple. If you're experiencing suffering, stop it. If you want more joy, go for it. It's really that simple. It's not easy. Read page 14 in, in Bill's story. At the very top of the page, he says, simple but not easy. He's about to give us a complete recap of the entire process of conversion. Simple but not easy. I'm quoting, simple but not easy. A price has to be paid. It means the destruction of self-centeredness. Here's the short-term pain. The destruction of self-centeredness, the deflation of the ego at depth, the steps one through nine. Oh my God, it's a lot of work. Oh my God, it's a lot of embarrassing. Oh my God, it's a lot of change. And yet on the other side of it, you go from the darkness to the light. You go from the turbulence to the smooth water. You go from a life of floundering to a life that flourishes. These are my experiences. I'm trying to capture them in words. Emotional sobriety, what does it look like? We go from and we are turned from disease to at easeness. All right, just think of the term disease. And then we go turning to at easeness. What does that mean specifically? It means that we get some abstinence. Sometimes it happens before, sometimes it happens during, but it always happens after you finish the ninth step. I'm not speculating, I'm not theorizing, I'm quoting from the big book page 84 and 85. If you haven't read it, it's very dense. Read it and, 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 and very carefully discern the words and the connections. We are placed in a position of neutrality. I'm quoting. I'm a big book literalist. What does that mean? I am placed, grace in a position of neutrality, recovered. Addiction is not an issue. I can sit at a table with anybody. I can go to a bar with anybody. I can keep alcohol and ice cream in my house. I am placed in a position of neutrality. But I have to deal with on a regular basis, after I do step four and identify my anger and my fear and my dishonesty and my, in, my inappropriate sexual behavior and my secrets and my guilt and shame and my unhealthy self-esteem, I can conclude that I am a very willful person. Remember that alignment concept, the flow of alignment. 
I can be in love and trust and guided by principles and rigorously honest and transparent and live a free life with healthy self-worth and a willingness to examine myself and to correct my behavior using my will. My will is out of alignment when I'm disturbed. My will is in alignment. when I'm in the flow. If I want to know if I'm emotionally sober, if I'm spiritually fit, take a look at that diagram. If the predominance of the words on the right are my experience, I am spiritually fit. If the predominance in my life are the words on the left, I'm spiritually unfit. It's not a judgment. It's just an evaluation. It's an inventory. It's a statement of fact. Do you want to live in disease or do you want to live at ease? And that's the whole question. How free do you want to be? Boy, it's my favorite question. Another favorite question is how big is your God? Many people need an upgrade. Many people need to trade in their concept of God for a bigger God. How big is your God? It's a question we're not going to answer right now, but I will be spending some time in a future three-hour session in one of these spirituality series on steps two and three. And we'll do a very deep dive in each one of those on each one of the steps or aspects of the steps. This is emotional sobriety. This is the second piece of the work that I wanted to introduce you to and the real heart of the matter of today, which was step 10, I believe is this, the tool for establishing as well as sustaining. Bill says we grow in understanding and effectiveness. Here are the words. I don't know whether Bill was knowledgeable in biology and psychology, but the two things that make us specifically human, as I indicated in the graph on the brain, are our, our mind that knows and our will that makes decisions. And he said in step 10, now we've entered the world of the spirit and our invitation is to grow in understanding in our mind and effectiveness in our will. Translate into our everyday language, we need to know what to do, and then we need the power to do it. That takes us into our next section on spiritual sobriety. We're gonna take a pause now though, to see if there are any questions or concerns or resistances or experiences that people would like to share like we did before. At this point in my sobriety, I should be much further along than I am. I but mean, by, I'm whose, much, by whose standard? By anybody, by yours. By, by I yours. don't judge you. Why do oh. you judge yourself? The real question is, where do you want to be? And then the second question is, where are you? And then if you see a gap in that, how can you change that gap? Okay, That's so, all. Yeah. So, so let me ask this question. Please. Yes, I can see that you've been cracked open by what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so to be at, the, at ease, does that mean you feel it or you just act like it? No, you, you, you feel it. You, you're okay. definitely, you're placed in a position of, uh, of neutrality. At the very least, you don't feel the red heat. At the very most, you feel the sunlight of the spirit. I, I wake up every day filled with joy and happiness and a sense of ease and comfort and purpose. So that position of neutrality where I'm safe and protected. I mean, I fundamentally don't feel that. And I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I mean, wait, I have wait, got wait, to wait, 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 I've invited you here. Do not short circuit yourself. You're worth it. You're worth this conversation. Please. Okay, so, 
Thank you. Thank you for that. So I feel like God has been really big in some areas of my life, but at now maybe this is the path, the journey that I, at some level, I just don't feel safe and protected. And I mean, I've done your, your 12 step online workshop this last month. I did Joe and Charlie again. I've done all my Allen on steps again. I'm looking for, you know, you said I can't earn it. I, I, I don't know else, how else to do it. So you're in a 12 step program. Would you like to share with us which one? Oh yeah, I'm an alcoholic. All right. I'm an alcoholic, Wonderful. I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic. All right. All I right. could be any of these. Uh, I understand that. And um, <laughs> so do you have a sponsor? Oh, I do, I have an amazing sponsor. So you talk to this person. All right, and have you worked the steps? Oh yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for 14 years. I've worked the steps many, many times with her, with my first sponsor, she's been my sponsor for 12 years, in workshops with my sober right. women friends. I mean, I, I, I work this program. All right, but all right. But what you're saying to me is, there's something amiss here. You've applied the steps, but you've not been given freedom. So there's something wrong here. Something wrong. <laughs> Something's missing here. Did you... Do a complete eight-step list. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't no, have that many. I just want an answer to the question. I don't yes. want editorial comments. I, I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> all right. Did you finish your ninth step, completing the amends for all of the people on your eighth step, to the best of your ability? To the best that I could, to the ones I remember. Their I understand. Names. And how long ago did you do that work? What, you mean the first one, or I mean... No. The, the last, last time you've done amends. Well, I made an amends to somebody in no, May. No, I don't mean, I don't mean oh. 10 step. I don't mean 10 step. I'm in a formal steps one through 12. Um, well, I mean, I, I told you, I just did two online workshops again. But it, the last wait, time wait, I did Wait, 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 you're, you're saying that as if, okay. no, I, I went shopping at, uh, at I, Ikea and I, and I got registered out and I, I, I got the bill. So I finished my, my, my shopping. That's the way you're talking about doing the step work. I don't believe it for a minute. You went to oh, class yeah. and you passed the exam, but you didn't have a transformation. What, no, what I, I have, in fact, I had a spiritual experience even this last weekend. Right. And, and I mean, I had a spiritual awakening All right. so in stop. May. All right, stop, stop, stop. It doesn't matter what you've had. You're uncomfortable. And you've already identified in yourself that something's amiss. So I'm asking some questions now. Do you have a daily meditation practice? On and off. <laughs> so the answer is no. See, you're well, not being honest with yourself or with me. Okay. I asked the question, do you have a daily meditation practice? You want to look good to yourself even. So you said on and off. But the answer is no, I don't have. Okay. Well, no, I do. I, I, re, I, 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 do I, I, I do two spiritual readings and then I do my 11th step, but I'm but not you, doing well, my... Wait, 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 wait. When you say I do my 11th step, what do you do? Well, I, you know, I, I do that little medit. I'm not right now. I feel like I don't have time to do my longer meditation, but I do that meditation, you know, seeking God's guidance. So then I'm not self seeking dishonest with self pity. And okay. so, so you, it seems to me like you do a lot of ritual with very little <laughs> connection of your humanity. Maybe, maybe. Oh well, no, that's the way you speak. I check the boxes. I check. That's how I feel right now. I'm checking all the boxes. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the way you're talking right now. All right. So I, I suggest you revisit what does it mean to have a consciousness practice. Take it out of the world of prayer and meditation and contemplation. Put it in the vocabulary of consciousness. I have a book uh, practicing the here and now. Read chapter one. And it, it has a complete overview of prayer, meditation, contemplation, mindfulness, um, certainly from step 11, but even broader than step 11. It might be helpful to you. But I believe that's where you're, 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 you're at the surface of doing all of the protocols and the rituals. But you don't have a taproot down into the life source. Okay. 
that would be, I mean, I'm not judging it. I'm, I'm trying to observe it. So say, just say, explore that for yourself. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. that's wonderful. Great question. Thank you very much. My question is, do you have any uh, tips for people that are like prone to emotional uh, relapse? You know, despite working the steps and having awareness and having a practice kind of having a tendency to, to allow people that are disrupting my serenity to, I don't know, kind of not really noticing, not like boundary issue, I guess, like real and yeah, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know you or your background and it would take some time for us to have a decent in-depth conversation, but it sounds at the surface level that you're talking about codependency mm -hmm. and that if you read a, a Melody Beattie's book, Codependent No More, it's a wonderful primer. Written in the mid-80s, it was really the pioneer work. It's very approachable. It's done in language that we can understand as non-trained people. And, and as I said before, it's so powerful. I'm reading it for the third time because there's a lot in there. And I believe it's applicable to anybody with any type of addiction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then again, then there's a specific program for that, which I know very little about it. And that's the uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics or CODA. I think they're similar but different. And they've got wonderful literature. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Great question. That's a wonderful question. Thank you. My question is like, a, what is the forgiveness there? It's like, as you say, I release, uh, forgiveness for you is the reliefness. Uh, so I release this person anyway because I clean. Apparently the... you haven't because you're talking about it. Well, I just, she's still in my life because she's my sister-in-law but I, I well no 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 it's not about her being a sister-in-law and still in your life she's still in your soul she's still in your heart she's still in your agitation i mean the way you're bringing it up right now tells me that there's tentacles of anger and resentment in you that she's not being who you think she uh, should have been well, my question is what hmm. does i mean release of when you say relieveness what does that mean? That, that means, means that you are neutral with regard to your feelings about her. Oh, that's what I mean. Uh, process of yeah. Neutral, neutral. And there's a prayer on pages 66 and 67 in the big book for the removal of deep resentment. So if you have a resentment or a deep resentment, you might want to take a look at those pages. And my experience is as I prayed that prayer on a daily basis, I was over about a three month period released from my deep resentment for my father and several other people that I had deep resentment for. Even though I did a fourth step and a ninth step, I still had these deep feelings, but in prayer, I was given a release from them. Okay. Yeah, I keep praying for, for the whole family. You yeah. Know? yeah. But no, 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 you didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. I didn't say you pray for them. I said, you pray for yourself. You pray for spiritual intervention of the divine surgeon that removes the cancer from your heart, removes the cancer from your soul, the cancer of resentment, the cancer of a negative feeling toward your sister-in-law. Oh. Yeah, there, there are solutions to this. So talk to your sponsor or talk to somebody else who has some familiarity with the forgiveness process. Certainly uh, read the book and it might be helpful to you. Thank you. Yeah, I will do that. So I just wanted to clarify in those releases, what is that? So yeah. It I'm means sorry. neutrality. Release means neutrality. I'm not, I'm not attracted to nor am I resisting. I, I don't have any feeling about it. I'm in neutral. And it can be about the uh, person, the entity, about anything. Everything, yeah. Thank yeah. You. No, wonderful clarification. I'm so glad you asked the question. Thank you for sharing your experience. So something happened to me just now, which happens to me more than once. I think the grass looks greener. I'm going to be sober 45 years, clean and sober. And I hear somebody, oh, they have the great sponsor, the great, well, I, I have been given so many gifts along the way. I mean, that's how come I'm here today. 
resentment, is it resentment? And me uh, pop up because I'm human, that's why. Um, and I could let go. Well, no, maybe, maybe, maybe. Like they it's have a, a great sponsor and what, my sponsor isn't well, good enough? It may, well, maybe it's an invitation. Maybe this agitation that you're feeling uh -huh. is, is merely an invitation that there's something more that may be available to you. Don't see it as envy or jealousy or comparison or any of the negative. No, no, no. This is the spirit making me aware that there's something that needs to be sanded smooth. That's all. How, how gentle is that? That's Invitation. Gentle. Nice. Yeah. You are saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Me feeling that gentleness. Yeah to let go of envy that someone got something better than me. Or, or seeing that not as envy, because that's your initial reaction, but seeing that as, oh, that's a feeling that I've been given by the spirit that invites me to have a deeper relationship. <laughs> that's nice. It is nice. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. All right. All right. See, right. because we have a choice. We have a choice. We can see the devil or we can see the spirit. We have a choice. We can see negative or we can see positive. Is yes. the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Okay. Reality doesn't change. But what is my attitude toward it? That's okay. emotional sobriety. No, that We've just modeled it right here. And I really appreciate your, the questions and the dialogue. Are you going to be giving us instructions about writing a 10 step? Is this a psychological thing we do? Are we going to follow, follow the big book literally? Ah, well, no, that's a great question because there's lots of misinterpretation by my standards of the 10 step. Nowhere in the big book nor in the 12 and 12 does it say it's in writing. Nowhere in the big book or in the 12 step, uh, 12 and 12 does it say it's at night. In fact, the 12 and 12 said it's a spot check inventory and it's a meditation. It's a prayer right now. I pause when agitated. I pray. I talk to somebody. I make an amend if I've hurt somebody. And I turn my thoughts to helping somebody else. It doesn't actually say I help anybody. So it's like 30 seconds. Boom. Yeah. So I'm really glad you asked that because I hadn't made that very clear. And now it's very clear. It's a, I can do 30 seconds. The what? I can do 30 seconds. Well, it's kind of like uh, my phone. It's kind of like my phone. I, I wear it on my hip when I'm walking around. The 10 step is a, is a tool that I carry with me that I engage in if I'm disturbed. Yeah. And sometimes I'm so disturbed, I don't know I'm disturbed. Until the night review, and Bill starts out step 11 by saying, Upon retirement, we do inventory. And that's the step 11 pickup, if in fact we missed it during the day. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. That was wonderful uh, expansion of and confirming of. That's great. Thank you. I have a sponsee that's on step 11. And um, I feel she's at 19 months of sobriety. And I feel that there's um, uh, this whole process has, has been surface level. And I know what's available, um, at least as far as I've gotten in my journey in sobriety is seven and a half years, which most of what we're talking about today has come to me in the last couple of years. And um, so how do you, as a sponsor, sit back and let them live? I, I, we're almost to 12, and I just want that big awakening. And But like what was just brought up recently, a few minutes ago, is that sometimes you have to ride it for a while and then go deeper and deeper, which has been my experience. But it's just so hard to watch. I, I just want to take her deeper, but she wants to stay. Uh, I get it. And it's wonderful that you have that sense of organic desire to share what you've experienced. 
Dr. Berger, as a psychologist, shared with me their kind of philosophy about that in therapy, and that is meet them where they're at, mm -hmm. not where you want them to be, not where they think they're at. Meet them where they're at. And sometimes I have to dumb down my instructions to people who are at a level that they can't absorb much depth. They could only do it at this level, not that level. So I give them this level, and if they get that, later on, the flower will bloom. Again, I heard of somebody say, you can't make a flower grow by pulling on it. Huh? Perfect. Oh my God, because this is organic. I, and that's why I tried to reveal my own personal process uh, as a time lapse over a long period of time. Not that everybody will have a long period of time, but they will have a process. And, and you, can't, you can't make it happen, especially because you've had it and now you have what you have and you got what you got when you got it. But if, even when you look back over your shoulder, that wasn't in the first year, was it? No, not even close. There you go, there you go. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even in the fifth year, I think you just said you have seven plus years and it's in the last couple of years that you've begun to really wake up. That's correct. And that's my personal experience. I don't say this out loud in public forum of meetings or anything, but I'll say it here is I believe I was a newcomer for five years. No, literally, thawing out physically so that I could be prepared to thaw out emotionally so that I could be prepared to thaw out spiritually, and that took 12 to 15 years. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that no, was a great question. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask about what you said about forgiveness. You said it's a decision to release them and to be released. Oh, um, good for you. No, no, no. See, that's a two-pronged decision. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I, I wasn't sure if that's what you said. I wanted you to, was that what you said, a decision to release them and to be released ourselves? Yes. Now, sometimes I don't know that it's about me getting released, or sometimes that's my motive. I'm trying to get free. The big book, very clear on 77, though, says about uh, mm, amends, that its, its primary purpose is to be useful to God and the people around us. It's not, about clean, it's not about me getting free and me healing. That's a secondary purpose. That's the, like the happiness thing. It's a byproduct. I will get free if I bring freedom to you. I'm, I'm, I'm really quite selfish. I want to know what's in it for me. <laughs> oh, well, welcome to the human race. Right, right, right. Because I think that his, I think up until now, I mistakenly hung on to my resentments because I, again, mistakenly thought that I needed to stay angry at the person in order to protect myself from yeah. getting hurt again. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering if... So I'm, I'm being very honest about saying, you know, if I forgive somebody, it has always felt like I was giving up something. And, and, I, and I thought I was giving up self-protection. So I was resistant. Why can't you protect them. yourself? Why can't you protect yourself without being angry? Well, that's what I'm asking. Is that what you, is that, is there a piece of forgiveness that releases me and I wonder if you could say a little more about how the forgiveness applies to me and benefits me. Obviously, if I forgive them, okay, I'm not holding an ax towards them every time I see them. But can you say more about what sure. it will do for me? You're holding a resentment because you think it's protecting you. And it's a cancer that will metastasize and squeeze the spiritual life and then the physical life outside of you. And that's science. Resentment creates cancer. Resentment, deep anger creates depression. It creates uh, brain embolisms. It creates um, heart attacks and strokes. The science is in, it's conclusive. And Bill said it in the book in 1939. Resentment is the number one killer. So by forgiving, I am also releasing myself from 
the source of depression and heart attacks, et cetera. Is that a yes? <laughs> yeah. Well, what does the Lord's Prayer say? I, it's not on the tip of my tongue. You'd have to tell me. <laughs> we forgive them their debts and we are forgiven ours. What does the St. Francis Prayer say? We forgive them and we are forgiven. See, there's a, dy and, and the St. Francis prayer was created in the 18th century. The Lord's prayer was created in the first century. Centuries apart by different people in different cultures, because the underlying dynamic is the human dynamic. To the extent that I release them, counterintuitively, I am released. Now, it's okay for you to have the motivation that I want to be healed and I want to be free, knowing that in order to do that, I've got to bring healing and freedom to them. I have no problem with that. We have very mixed motives, and every one of us at the heart of the heart of the heart, getting underneath the underneath the underneath, we're all selfish and self-centered, because it's about our survival and our flourishing at the, at the basic biological and psychological level. Yeah. So I can look forward to, if I am willing to forgive somebody else, I can look forward to that it will also release me in the process. That's my total 100% experience. I'll take it. Thank yeah. you. No, no, thanks. Great question. Thank Great dialogue. All right. So now we're going to continue. The, the dialogue uh, and the sharing has been so rich, and it's always my most favorite part. We're in spiritual sobriety. So ask yourself, what does it mean, spiritual sobriety, spiritual growth? All right? It means to improve your conscious contact. Step 11, the words itself, right in the step itself, tells you what the mission is, to improve uh, your conscious contact. Oh, that must mean I have uh, contact, number one, and I have conscious contact. Oh, yeah. In step two, I decided I have contact, existential contact. There is a God, and that God is deep down inside of me. Uh, read pages 53 and 55. 53, God is or God isn't. What is your choice? 55, God is deep inside of me. I can find that God thinking honestly, think, uh, searching diligently, and searching fearlessly. Two paragraphs that say the same thing, obviously very important paragraphs. And in step three, establishing a conscious relationship, making a decision to turn. So we remove all of the obstacles, uh, steps four through 10, in us to that power that is in us, and we improve that conscious contact. But as I mentioned, we enlarge our consciousness and our conscious contact through work and self-sacrifice for others. Again, that's the turning from other with a capital O to others with a small O, steps 11 and step 12. I see this as spiritual sobriety. I see it as a coin. You have to determine, is God necessary? And what does that mean to you? G-O-D. It's merely a word. The word is not the reality. That's the significance of step two. We get to choose our concept. We get to choose our word, our phrase. What do you need? What do you want as a power? Step one, I don't have choice. I don't have power. Step two, I hope there is a power and I'm going to live my life as if it's true step three. The man who took me through the work in 1988, the very first time I went through the work, explained meditation. Oh my God, I was in a monastery for seven years, 1957 to 1964. When I left the monastery in 1964, I hung up my black robe and I did not meditate again for 25 years. Seven years of daily meditation, seven years of studying to become a Catholic priest, seven years of monastic silence. 
Yeah. And I walk out at age 24 and I don't meditate for another 25 years. What is that? Well, because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what meditation was. Bill says upon awakening on pages 85 to 88, the most succinct and effective description of meditation, what it is and how to do it that I've ever come across. Pages 85 to 88, instructions on what meditation is and how to do it. The first thing this man said was look up the word in a dictionary, meditation. My dictionary said it's directed thinking. And that's Bill's direction, isn't it? Upon awakening, we ask God to direct our thinking. And in fact, he says we think about the 24 hours a day and we consider our plans for the day. He doesn't give us any description of what that means. I know from literary style of Bill's, he's never redundant. So he must mean two things when he gives us two directions. Think about the 24 hours a day I've interpreted as my activity, my day planner. And I do a radar scan, scan of my day. Is there anything in my behavior and my activity that I've planned that's out of line with my understanding of spiritual principles? Since 1988, the answer has always been no. But what is the answer to the second question? Consider my plans for the day. What does he mean by that? I don't know but I make up a definition for myself. If in fact the first instruction is about my behavior, maybe the second instruction is about my very being. The first instruction is what is I'm going to do. The second is about who am I going to be today? So I scan my day and I look at yesterday and I say, yesterday I was unkind, today I'm going to be kind. Yesterday I was insensitive, today I'm going to be sensitive. Yesterday I was very distracted, today I'm going to be focused and mindful. If you're getting the pattern here, my, 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 my invitation and my question is, so what is my character defect du jour? I'm always human and I'm never going to transcend my humanity. How did my, manif how did my humanity manifest in an unhealthy way that I don't like? from yesterday. And that's what I'm going to try to focus on today. Kindness, sensitivity, consideration, mindfulness, whatever the word is. But that's all interesting. But here's the key that unlocked the door to meditation for me forever. Since the last 32 years, I have not had any problem with meditation on a daily basis. Because this man said what the big book doesn't say. He gave me an interpretation based on his experience. The book says, we ask God to direct our thinking. This man said, it's a prayer. God, please direct my thinking. The big book says, then we begin thinking. So then I begin thinking about my day and considering my plans. Here's what the big book doesn't say. What this man said was the key. We listen to our thinking as if the content of our thinking is the transmission of the message from God. My thinking is the medium of the message. The only way God speaks to me is not through my ears audibly. I've never heard God speak once. I have heard the Holy Spirit, the deep, quiet sound or voice speak to me all the time through my heart, through my gut, through my senses, through my inspiration. We ask God to direct our thinking. God, please direct my thinking. Then we begin thinking, what am I going to do today? And I listen. And you've heard it in the meetings, I'm sure, but it might take on new relevance in the context of this conversation. Prayer is when I'm talking to God. Meditation is when I'm listening to God. What am I listening to? I'm listening to my thinking. I'm listening to my feelings. I'm listening to my awareness. I'm listening to my consciousness as the possible message from the Spirit. That changed my life. I went to a spiritual director after that, and I asked him after a year of practice, I said, I'm very bored with my practice. 
And I explained to him steps one through nine and my commitment to step 11, my understanding of directed thinking, all the stuff we've talked about today. And he didn't know anything about 12 step, but he had a deep, deep understanding and experience with spirituality. And he said, oh, Herb, after 45 minutes of my talking, he said, Herb, I get it. Time out, time out. I get it. You're a very task oriented person. You have a book, you've read it, you've highlighted it, you've outlined it, you have a practice and you practice your practice and you're going to become spiritual and you're going to become a good meditator. He said, you're very task oriented and meditation is not a task to be accomplished. It's not an event, it's an experience. It's not an event, it's a process. He said, think this thought, he really got the 12-step process. He really understood powerlessness because of this next comment. You're as powerless over your spiritual life as you are over alcohol having no power. You're as powerless over your meditation as you are over your alcohol having no power. Sit in the presence of power, humbled by your powerlessness, and be open to the movement of the spirit. You're responsible for the effort and the results are none of your business. Do not judge or evaluate your meditation. There's only two mistakes that you can make in meditation. Powerful simplicity. There's only two mistakes that you can make in meditation. One, not show up. Two, leave early. Everything in between is none of your business. On my way out the door, after we finished our conversation, he said, oh, by the way, Herb, if you want to know if your meditation practice is effective, after 90 days of consistent daily meditation, ask your wife how you're treating her. Oh, man, of course. If your meditation is effective, you will change. I mean, that's what he said. And of course, that was my experience with the steps and with this process. After a period of time of consistent fidelity and diligence, consistent fidelity and diligence, I am changed. Bill has a, a wonderful model in step 11 in the 12 and 12 that is different than the model in the big book. And he says, if you have trouble with meditation, as many people do, he says, pick a prayer. And he uses the St. Francis prayer. It's in the step 11 in the 12 and 12. And, and, and read a word or a phrase and then close it and chew on it mentally and spiritually. What does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply to me? What is the impact? How do I translate that into action? And of course, that question that I love that I pointed out during our conversation, what's the invitation? And then once you've chewed on that word or phrase for a while and it's gotten stale like use gum, go to the next word or phrase and chew on it and get the juice from it. What does it say? What does it mean? What's its relevance to me? What's my experience with that? What behavior is it asking of me? What's my invitation? Hear the meditation, because I'm thinking about it, and I'm listening to my thinking, but I'm being directed by the reading of an inspirational book one day at a time, or a prayer, or the Bible, or the Quran, or some inspirational psychological book, or whatever, is helping us to think about our own personal life and development. Pay attention with your mind and think, as I've already mentioned in detail. Again, I'll be doing another series, another event on Step 11, as well as the broader uh, word of intentional consciousness later on. 
and we use my will to have intention. See, prayer is not about the words. It's about what is my intention. Instinct, intuition, inspiration, all a variety of ways of saying there's an awareness in us coming from our body, coming from our senses, coming from our emotions, and coming from our thoughtfulness. Well, listen to it all. Listen to it all. And if in your doubt you go to a sponsor or a spiritual director or a therapist and you talk about it and you use them as a sounding board. So if you want to have uh, a meditation practice, if you're motivated and you don't have one, start with one minute of intentional consciousness. Most teachers talk about 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. Don't try that at the beginning. It's like going to the gym in January 2nd. If you exercise too long on your own, you will hurt yourself and you won't come back on January 3rd. But if you hire a teacher, a, a coach, a trainer, and you do 15 minutes and then you come back and you do 20 minutes and then you do 30 minutes in the gym, eventually you'll be in good shape and you won't need a teacher and a trainer as often. Show up and don't leave early. A method, not a technique. An action based on faith, not knowledge. Is God necessary? Is there a power other than yourself? The underlying assumption of step 11 is steps two and three. If you're having problems with step 11, it probably is either because you haven't connected to step one, that you need power, or step two, that there is a power that is available to you. So this is an awareness, not a feeling. Feelings are a trap for us, especially. It's a trap for all human beings in the spiritual life. Feelings are powerful and necessary. They're signals to us. In the 10th step, when I'm disturbed, that's a signal. It tells me I'm out of alignment. When I'm in joy, that's a signal. It tells me I'm doing what my human nature is going to flourish with. Our feelings are really important and paying attention to our feelings, but us managing them, regulating them ourselves. Dr. Berger talks about the, our center of gravity deep down inside ourselves. Our center of gravity is deep down inside of myself. My center of gravity used to be in people, events, and circumstances. I was like a puppet on strings. And when people, circumstances, and uh, events changed, it would change me like a puppet on a string. And step four and five cut those strings. An experience, not a task. I use the term intentional consciousness because it captures the broader form of prayer and meditation and contemplation and mindfulness, transcendental meditation, or whatever the words are that come from your own background, education, and tradition. If you have a consistent practice, you will have an awareness of presence. That's Bill's promise in, in the spiritual experience in 567, 568, Appendix 2. Awareness of the presence of God is the essence of a spiritual experience. I love that line. Dense, worthy of meditation itself. Awareness of the presence of God. He's not the knowledge, not the feeling. Awareness is not knowledge. Awareness is not feeling. It's a consciousness that includes all of that but transcends it. Awareness of the presence of God is the essence of a spiritual experience. Healing of brokenness. I never had authentic self-esteem. I read a book on it in preparation for a retreat that I was asked to do. And it was a good book. The one line I remember that was, again, so simple and so wise. If you want self-esteem, do esteemable things. When you do esteemable things, you will become esteemable in your own eyes. Oh my God, could it be that simple? Yes, it is. And it's actually been confirmed now in 
brain science. Dan Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L, is a psychiatrist, medical doctor, psychiatrist at UCLA. Done a lot of work in the brain. Many books on it. And he has confirmed what we know in spirituality and in the 12-step program. He has confirmed it scientifically. It doesn't matter what you know, and it doesn't matter what you feel. It does matter what you do. And when you do differently, you will know differently and you will feel differently because you change the biology of your brain. You create new neuronal paths and synapses when you behave differently. And then you will establish a habit of knowing and feeling different. We didn't know that 15 years ago. We thought the brain was inert, not going to grow, not going to change. But now we know. We change the biology and physiology of our very brain when we take different actions. If we take the negative actions, we change it negatively. If we take the positive actions, we change it positively. This creates harmony within myself, an integration, a feeling of homeostasis, a very large word that says, when I'm thirsty, when I take a drink of water, then I'm not thirsty any longer. When I'm hungry and I eat some food, I'm not hungry any longer. All right? That sense of thirst and hunger are the human things that tell me what I need. Those are the feelings in us too. They tell me what I need. If I'm feeling suffering, I need to get out of the fire. If I'm feeling joy, I need to embrace the actions that bring me joy. This is really the basic lesson of, of the happiness doctrines and the research that's been done. Listen to others more carefully. Most of us have sponsors and are in fact helping other people. This helps us really listen to others with compassion, with empathy, as somebody mentioned earlier in our conversation. It brings us into unity with reality. That's that alignment I'm talking about. We could get quite metaphysical here, and I won't. This unity is the harmony. This unity is the flow. This unity is the alignment with reality as it is, not as we want it to be, not as we think it should be, but as it actually is. I mentioned that a spiritual awakening is a change, a change in the way we think and feel and behave. And it's done to us, but not without us. Of course, step 12 says that we need to carry the message, and we do that organically, eventually, because we want to help other people. The first line on page 89 says, nothing will so much ensure immunity. If we have a spiritual malady, we have the promise of immunization, inoculation. That enlarging our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. But we have to practice principles. You know, there's a principle of uh, physics called gravity. And if you transgress gravity, you will die. Jumping off a 30-story building because it was a good idea you wanted to fly was a fantasy that will end up in your death. Because... Gravity doesn't care about what you want or feel or try. Gravity just is. There are principles that may be universal, may be human, may be spiritual principles in our family, in our relationships, in our work. Chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 in the big book. Bill never gives us a list of principles. But he says, we practice these principles in all our affairs. See, that's helping us stay in alignment. This is spiritual sobriety, staying in alignment with the principles of reality. What is reality? That's the, best, the basis of the serenity prayer. We have a 12-step program. It has lots of moving parts, meetings, certainly, the big book, certainly, 12 steps, all right, magical. 
prayer, of course, because we're powerless, service in terms of helping other people, contrary actions. But I mentioned it earlier, and I want to reemphasize it here. The most important principle, the most important component part is sponsorship. Having an accountability partner. As a human being, I need a sounding board. I need it less today than I did 30 years ago. When I first came in the program, I called a sponsor every day because he asked me to, and I told him what I was thinking, feeling, and doing on a daily basis. After, oh, probably 10 or 15 years, I stopped doing that by mutual agreement. And now I sit with my sponsor once a month to chat. Basically, we're good friends and I'm a sounding board for him and he's a sounding board for me. But I have other accountability partners. My wife died about three years ago. So I lost that accountability partner, but my two daughters, one in AA for 30 years, one in al for 30 years, stepped right up. And they're very glad to be my accounting partner, accountable partner and, and a sounding board. And quite frankly, they're a little less soft on me than my wife was. <laughs> then they kind of relish that. <laughs> but I also have a therapist uh, that I had at one point, but I can use as a sounding board, Dr. Berger, and I have as the sponsor, and I have good friends. And um, occasionally we'll talk to some of my sponsees in a transparent way so that I model for them that transparency that I'm asking of them. As I've mentioned so many times, it's a process though, a process of integration and slowly like the Maslow model, it's one of physical sobriety, then emotional sobriety, and then spiritual sobriety. It was a long process for me, it doesn't have to be for you, but it probably will be longer than certainly a week or a weekend or a year even. The real problem is, it's like a dimmer switch not a light switch. The spiritual experience is a light switch. The spiritual awakening is a dimmer switch. It went up a notch at a time for me over about a 15 year period, but it can go down a notch at a time with a little bit of untreated unmanageability, those bedevilments, spiritual malady, the manifestation of selfishness, self-centeredness. Bill says we're extreme examples of self will run riot. Gerald May calls it willfulness rather than willingness. Untreated resentment, untreated fear, a little secret, a little flirtation. No, it's no big deal. People flirt and it's just fun. No, wrong. At least by my standards, you all have to figure out your standards. What are your standards? What are your principles? But if you ignore and or go against the flow of your principles, the dimmer switch goes down a notch at a time and the darkness descends and the obsession returns and the delusion is, I'm okay now, I got this. It's been a long time and uh, it'll be different this time and it never is different in the best sense, it's always different in the relapse sense. Integration goes forward one notch at a time on the dimmer switch. Disintegration goes forward one notch at a time on the dimmer switch. The 12 step goal is a spiritual awakening. There are principles turning through these 12 steps from the world of self, steps one through nine, to the world of the spirit, steps 10 through 12. I call this optimal recovery, these first nine steps. That's the program of recovery. That's leading to freedom from addiction, the first half of the first step. Optimal living, however, is where we want to live and flourish. We enter the world of the spirit, and this is optimal living. A place of our personal happiness. And so we have to ask ourselves, or at least we normally ask ourselves, so who's coming to save me? 
this is the first question coming into a program. Oh my God, I'm drowning, I'm dying, or maybe even now where I'm abstinent, but I, my life is still serial suffering in answer to one of the questions I asked earlier. Who is coming to save me? <laughs> Nobody's coming. Oh my God, that was a sign over a psychologist's office in West LA. No, literally. Who would go to somebody like that and pay them money when you walk in the door? It says nobody's coming. Well, because he wanted to bring emotional sobriety to us. He wanted us to figure out, I'm the one I'm waiting for. In steps one through nine, I need to develop a consciousness practice, receiving the light, aware of my feelings, awake to disturbance, taking responsibility for alignment and realignment. This is what Maslow called self-actualization. I'm actualizing my true self by taking full responsibility for my self. Step 10. Step 11 is consciousness practice. Becoming a lantern. I am responsible for the effort, not result. My image of sponsorship is that I'm a lantern standing by the path, shining the light of my experience on the path that I walk, so that others can walk that path in the light of my experience. I give suggestions. If they take my suggestions, their life will improve. If they don't take my suggestions, their life will deteriorate. I'm not invested in their life being improved, or I'm not invested or concerned about their life deteriorating, concerned in the sense of trying to manage it. I'm passionate about it. I stay gently pressed up against it, but as my step guides have all said, I don't want it for them more than they do. I will not work harder than they work. I am responsible for my effort, not the results. This is a journey, not a destination. It's a process, not a task. All the stuff I've talked about earlier, I'm recapping right now, and experience, not an event. Self-actualization is step 10, but self-realization is step 11 from my standpoint. I, I grow deeper as my authentic self to the extent that I'm consistent with my intentional consciousness practice. But the question then becomes, so who is coming to help them? This is an organic thing. Some people do it because they should or because it's step 12 or because they're at sponsor direction. And that's good enough to begin with. Eventually, it'll become organic and natural and coming flow from the inside rather than a mandate from the outside. We are the one they are waiting for. This is not poetry. This is not fluff and stuff. This is about helping people to awake. And as somebody pointed out, Debbie pointed out earlier, it's all about being self-interested self-centered. I want to have a fabulous life. Well, if I really do, then in fact, it's going to require me to be concerned with and helping other people. That's a fundamental principle of the human structure and human nature. Now, I can do it because that's my motive to be self-centered and to flourish myself, or I can do it from the motive that I really do want to help other people. And of course, all of us will come with mixed motives. I do this work and have committed my life to it because I finally converted from a seeker to a finder. I thought seeking was the badge of courage until I began to find in 1988. And, I, and quite frankly, finding is a lot better than seeking. And now I found a path that is absolutely 100% effective, I can help other people navigate that path. I, I become a lantern to light up the path and I have developed some compassion. I became a priest because it was the ego thing to do back in the 50s. 
I became, I, I wanted to be a psychologist because it was the financial thing to do in the 60s and the 70s. It wasn't about them. It was about me. I have now been given the gift of a compassion for other people trying to transmit this light, wanting to help, not necessarily um, am I invested in actually helping, but I can put it out there because I don't have a self-interest involved in it. I looked up the word altruism the other day. If you really want to understand love, there's so many definitions. I love coffee. I love my dog. I love my children. I love my bank account. I love my wife. I love my program. I love sobriety. You see, I use love in so many different terms right then. It's the context that gives it the meaning. What does love mean? And I'm, I've been in pursuit for the last three years. It's kind of like the dynamics and understanding of that. So I looked up the word altruism. It comes close to the best definition, altruism. Doing something for somebody else's benefit with no possible benefit for myself. Bam. That's, for me, unconditional love. That's transcending myself. That's lighting the path for others. What I've learned in my study on happiness, it's a daily practice. It's a commitment and a practice. We use that word, practice, because we're not perfect. Bill saw that on page 60, didn't he? Progress, not perfection. My God, we're human beings and we'll never be perfect. I know 30% of you are perfectionists. It's okay. It's neurotic, but it's okay. It's unhealthy, but it's okay. It's just who you are. All right. And as you stay gently pressed up against this work, that will mean that will diminish gently over time to a point where it won't be driving you. It's just not healthy. We commit to intentional consciousness. It really helpful to have a gratitude list because you grow in, in positivity. This is the single most important recommendation in all the happiness studies is and, and they talk about, I, I made up my own recommendation here. Have a list. Each morning, add one thing to it that you're grateful for. Each morning, add one thing. It can never duplicate anything else on the list. Can you get it? After 30 days, it's going to be a challenge to be creative so that you're reaching for, what am I grateful for today? Okay, I can breathe today. Um, what am I grateful for today? Okay, I had a... A, a wonderful night's sleep. I mean, you're going to have to be creative if you're going to add to the list and never duplicate what you were create what you were grateful for yesterday. It will it will completely reorient the way you look at reality, the way you look at yourself, and the way you look at other people. Prayer, of course, will reduce your defects and increase your virtue. If you don't understand that, come to my teaching on step six and seven. There's a list of the spirituality series. There's going to be 10 over the next 10 months. And uh, we'll be doing a deep dive in specifics with regard to each of the steps and mm, some of the topics that are contained in the steps. Meditation, of course, I believe that's the taproot into power. Bill uses that in the spiritual experience. The unsuspected inner resource unsuspected inner resource. Think of oil well drilling down into the power source. Helpful actions, kindness, simple as that. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others. No matter what their attitudes and or what their behaviors are, stay out of harm's way, but have this attitude. Wear these lenses. Look through the lenses I want to be kind today. And above all, accountability, as I've mentioned, for all of these commitments. Accountability is, I believe, the key. 
the key to emotional sobriety, the key to spiritual sobriety. Emotional sobriety, the key step is 10. The key to living in balance, going from being at cross purposes with reality to being in alignment with reality. And then step 11 and 12 as the coin. Step 11 to improve our consciousness and step 12 to be fully human and fully alive. I'm going to continue at least for another 10 or 15 minutes with um, people who might have questions about this last segment or comments or experiences that they want to share and or anything else that was said today or wasn't said today that they might want me to talk about. Desire. So, for example, I'm working right now and I have a desire to get validated from my bosses for the hard work I'm doing. In these moments where these needs are not met, of course, I'm a compulsive overeater, I tend to go to food for comfort. So I just want to see you in your framework, in the framework you've just shown us, how can you turn this desire into or fulfill that desire, knowing very well that's not going to happen and not have the expectation from my boss that she can say, Good job today, or whatever. So, just wanted to know that. Well, right, see, what you raised is a really wonderful question, but it's very complex. What I heard is a biological problem. I heard a psychological problem. I heard a sociological problem. Biology at the level of comfort. I mean, that's the, the whole source of addiction, is that we have tension and we have a history of reducing our tension by drinking or by using a drug or by using a food uh, or by manipulating it or thinking that we manipulate and control or by anger or by fear. The, our addictions are our go-to place for reducing the tension in our life. That's why Bill gives us steps four through nine to eliminate, eliminate, not just diminish, to eliminate the sources of tension in our life. So at the biological level, there's a, a issue here um, and the food addiction is probably the most complicated and the most difficult one to deal with because it's so cultural and it's so individual. I'm not going to attempt to deal with it. I'm just identifying that that's one of the issues here. The next was the, the psychological issue of a sense of self-esteem. I'm in my work and I'm being paid to get job done. Now, I like approval and I like compliments but I get a paycheck. I'm not there to get self-esteem. If I'm there to get self-esteem, I'm in the wrong place. I'm there to be paid. I'm there to contribute so that they will pay me. I contribute more so they pay me more. All right. That's, the, that's their recognition of me. If they give me anything else, that's a bonus. Now, Really good employers know that people really do flourish under a positive environment and, uh, and, and, uh, and some esteemable comments and a sense of friendliness and a sense of uh, safety. Good employers know that, but not all employers are aware or care. They just want the job done. So if you're going to work to get self-esteem, you're going to a potential well without water. And then the sociology, but it's normal to want approval and self-esteem and good relationships, right? And so we have to figure out where that happens. And as simple as it is, somebody said, if you want a friend, be one. If you want to be in a room with people who appreciate you, be there appreciating them. And again, once again, once I did this work, I was capable, number one, of understanding what I just said. And number two, living in a way that allowed people to be friendly to me and to be responsive to me.
I mean, already I've on this call, even many people have thrown flowers at my feet. That's nice. I like that. Of course, I have to be very careful because I'm a recovering narcissist and I don't want to have that as my primary motive. And my own spiritual director said, be concerned, Herb, be concerned. It will feed the dragon. Absolutely. Be concerned, but never let your concern get in the way of your ministry. Oh, what a great comment on understanding and compassionate man. He's a psychologist, deeply spiritual guy. And, and he knew, yes, you need to be concerned about this deep darkness in you, but never let your concern get in the way of the way you can help people because you have a special gift to be able to help people with their own spiritual lives. Is that, I'm not sure all of that helped, but it certainly is the, my response to you. Yeah. Very extremely helpful. Extremely. All right. What came up for me when you were talking about, after you were talking about that forgiveness book, uh, was how I realized that I overcompensate for emotional deprivation by seeking approval. Oh, yeah. And, and what I do to seek approval is to show off. I seek attention. I know more than anyone else about whatever subject or whatever. And then the other side of that coin is play victim, complain to garner sympathy and attention. Wow. And it reminds me of where it says our ego digs two disastrous pitfalls. And I'm trying to be, I guess they call it dialectical here and find the gray area. But yeah. then when you said the empty well, it reminds me of a story where you know, I move into a new town and there's a well and everybody says it's dry, but I climb up there and I'm going to, I'm just determined I'm going to get water out of the well. And every time I uh, lower the bucket, I get less and less water. But it's like, it finally came to the conclusion that, you know, what is it about me that insists on lowering that bucket over and over again? So. See, that's, that's the, then that's a specific problem for the addict the problem of the mind that has this investment in the delusion, it'll be different this time. It's so universal amongst us. And we don't see that for 30 years, it hasn't been different, but I don't remember that it wasn't different. And I really do mean different. It's going to be better. And it's always different. It's always worse, but I don't see the progression. I don't see it. It's mind boggling. I, I get goosebumps when I, when I talk about it and remember my own history. Yeah. How do we let go of expectations? Yeah. How do we first, first identify them. What are your, ex this is rhetorical. I'm not yeah. asking you to respond. You're welcome to, but I'm not asking you to. Ask yourself, so what are my expectations? You see, um, uh, Dr. Luskin talked about um, unenforceable rules. We have this story. Mothers should, daughters should, husbands should, employers should. These are unenforceable rules. These are stories and figments of our imagination. Most of us have been way overexposed to Disney. <laughs> No, seriously, the fairy godmother, the prince, uh, the magic dust, the fairy wand. Uh, uh, there's no magic. The cavalry is not coming. That's why I love that. Nobody's coming. Nobody's coming. God, wait, 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 wait. God's not coming. If there is this reality, it's already here. I have to establish contact in step two and three, and I have to improve conscious contact in step 11. God is or God isn't. God is everything or God is nothing. What is your choice? That's heavy, does it? So your work is to identify your expectations. Is it realistic? I might want to be an astronaut, but it's a 
unreasonable expectation on my part. So I need to adjust to the reality. I don't have the skills or so many other things. So my expectations might be created by delusions, by parents, by culture, by, by books I've read. It, it's about dealing with reality as it is, not to minimize reality, to identify it. what is reality. It just is. One of my good friends says, reality is not personal. Don't take it personally. Reality just is what it is. Earthquakes happen. Volcanoes happen. Genocide happens. It's just what is. If I have free will, I can exercise it properly or I can exercise it improperly. That's reality. I know. We put on our, we put on our big boy and big girl pants. Yeah, you remind me of a question that uh, was shared with me once that said, what if nothing is wrong? <laughs> well, wrong is a relative term. Yeah. All right. right. So, so if, a, if, a, if a deer goes down to the lake to get a, a drink of water, that's a really good thing for the deer. When the mountain lion sneaks up behind the deer and eats the deer, that's a really bad thing for the deer, but it's a really good thing for the mountain lion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, no, it's called perspective. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I've been trying to do the contemplation. And to be honest, I was cutting back on the meditation because, you know, but I realize I do my meditation in a way. Uh, and and when you ex when I was in the workshop last year, and you explain the simplicity of what meditation was in terms of being quiet and then observing my thoughts, if I got that right, it was an enormous weight off my shoulders. Because uh, me too, yeah. Because I, because I want to feel like I'm doing it right, you know. Yes. And um, that was a gift. Anyway, so, you know, uh, the observation that the only way you can do it wrong is not to do it or to leave early. Right. Um, and with the contemplation, you know, I'm sitting there, I've got ADD and I have my, I have my word and, and I'm telling you that just about every breath I take, I have to repeat the word, Yeah. but I am kind of sort of task oriented and so i i know i have to leave it alone and it will happen and i have to persevere and that's a great thing that i've learned in program and uh, the man who helped me the most that gave me the key to uh it's not a task it's a process and that i'm powerless he said he has a mantra he said all people on a spiritual path have a spiritual practice and they practice their practice and they're faithful to their practice and eventually their practice is faithful to them. Oh, I like that. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. After several weeks or months, whatever you figure it out, of consistent practice of this contemplative journey that you sound like you're on and it sounds wonderful, stop and pause and look back over your shoulder at a time period and ask, have I improved as a person? Am I more sensitive? Am I more conscious? Am I more kind? Am, am, has my behavior changed almost without my effort and without knowing it? And it might be three months or it might be six months, but I don't think it's any less than that. And I wouldn't wait any more than that. Someplace in there, look back over your shoulder. And when I do that, I can see progress. I can't see progress today. And I can't see progress when I think about it or feel it. I see progress in my behavior. How do I behave? And that's why the question, how are you treating your wife, was so important. He added to it, how are you driving? Yeah. How are you treating retail personnel at a store? All right. Because if you will become kinder, you will become more sensitive and aware of your surroundings. And I find that's, that's exactly what's happened. 
Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. In my walk with my sponsor this time around, I never knew what self-centeredness and self-seeking looked like until he said, I want you to tell me how you start your day. And I said, okay, I, uh, awakening, I, I, I look at my uh, 24 hours and I say, I'm going to do this and that, and I have this to do and that to do. And, and he says, now, I want you to re really think about that. Did you hear yourself? And I said, yeah, I, I, I'm going to do all these things, which I think are very good things to do. And I think I'm going to be a service. I, I've got it. And he said, no, 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 no. You didn't really listen, did you? He said, all of your thoughts were about you. You're going to do. You're going to get. You're going to do. You're going to be of service. You, you. Never once in your thinking had you thought about others. And once I heard that, I said, well, my, my whole life has been like that. He says, yeah, <laughs> you got it. And I was silent. I, I, I couldn't, I, the impact of that moment mm. was absolutely amazing to me. Yeah, that's the advantage of a sounding board. A sounding board who has knowledge and experience, they call that wisdom, and it, it helps us to wake up. And I've, I've shared many times throughout even our journey today, the many times that there was the sounding board for me, that was the, oh, <laughs> that wake up time. And that's, it's a dimmer switch experience. The wake up happens as we stay gently pressed against the dimmer switch, moving it forward. Occasionally, there's enough light to see more than we were able to see before. And that keeps me moving forward. Now, we're going to pray the prayer of St. Francis, and uh, you're welcome to pray it. You're all on mute, I hope, and uh, we'll pray it. I, I, I encourage you to pray it out loud. I will pray it out loud, and you're welcome to be in sync with me. It's on the slide. Lord, make me a channel of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Hear the process here. Hear the promises here. Hear the dimmer switch process slow turning from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. Eckhart Tolle in The Power of Now said, The Secret to Life. Wow, what an ominous beginning. The secret to life is to die before you die and realize there is no death. That's another meditation. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your participation.